Code, which is the Global Warming Solutions Act. And um, one of the findings we have in the bill, just as, as kind of a placeholder, relates to some things in uh, public finance. And um, you have also done a, a great deal of work in recent years on um, you know, some of these big picture issues that affect our state, uh, certainly that you work in, in water. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you had a chance if you were interested, and I appreciate you taking up the invitation to join us uh, um, just with some thoughts on the bill. Um, we're very open to any improvements we can make, and as I said, I think you know the focus was on uh, with you being uh, the, you know, essentially the chief financial officer for our state. Um, this is an important thing to, to, to talk to. So welcome, and, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for the record, Beth Pierce, the state treasurer, and. Uh, I start, I'm going to start with I wholeheartedly support the bill. Um, I think that this is a, a big step in the right direction. I'd like to read a little bit of a, what I started to write in terms of a really long report and then uh, not do that uh, for the rest of this because I don't want to completely bore you with that. Exactly. We've got another seven or eight hours. Yeah, By the end of that, so that. Uh, most of my reports, you know, stop at page 90 or so. You know, <laughs> Clean Water, I think, was 93 plus probably three single times more than yeah, uh, uh, single. <laughs> okay, uh, but decent type. Uh, but uh, so let me just start off with uh, a, a few comments that came from doing the clean water report and thinking about uh, the issues as they relate to climate change and and also we have on our on our web page a um, report called environmental social and governance which talks about some of the efforts that we're making uh, in respect with respect to investments in climate change and uh, I think that if you're interested you should take a look at that and maybe that's one thing you should we should talk about in terms of um, um, we're looking to develop some metrics and working with some of the environmental community to develop some metrics in our investments, um, and that might be something we should talk about uh, here. But let me just start off with a, a basically a statement, you know, that climate change is a serious threat to our way of life, the future well-being of our citizens, and also our bottom line. Uh, th these threats, you know, are not some way down the road. They're here right now with us and it's going to require a collaborative effort from all parties and local, state, federal governments and in concert with the private sector, and I think your, your bill addresses that, must do more to address uh, the issues that face us and there are dire consequences for not doing it. Now we've been a model for a many number of years in solar and wind and clean water technologies, but we need to do more. Uh, we've articulated very ambitious goals, but we have not met those goals and presently do not uh, without this bill, do not have a path to meet them. Uh, we haven't done nearly enough to combat climate change and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. I'm going to read a couple of lines from uh, a report that uh, was cited in um, uh, Business Magazine. Um, and uh, basically, the bulk of a month's total emissions from uh, transportation and uh, are from transportation and heating sector, 71%. And this is from a DEC report. Vermont has already missed important greenhouse gas reduction goals and is likely to miss future emission goals. Um, 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 uh, uh, let me do that again. To miss future goals as emissions have continued to rise in the years. And going to another uh, ANR report, Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions remain at levels of well above its reduction goals established in state statute in the, comp in the Comprehensive Energy Plan. Each successive year, of increasing emissions levels makes achieving the state's emission reduction goals significantly more difficult. You know, a couple of years ago, we wrote a, uh, an op-ed, we wrote a big clean water report, which uh, uh, I, I appreciate the efforts that were made by the House and the uh, Senate uh, after that in the General Assembly and the Governor to make some real strides in clean water. Uh, but we wrote an op-ed and it was a financial case to protect uh, Vermont's water. And as I was thinking about that, I, in that report I said, we have a choice to act or defer action. Um, and we can't continue to defer action. Simply put, there is no choice without jeopardizing the health of our citizens, our economy, our natural resources, and our way of life. We are in a similar position now with the task ahead of us. Delay is at our peril, and each year we delay, we have more risk and more cost. But bottom line, we must act. Now, I want to go through a couple of, uh, of pieces on that. Uh, you, you've probably heard all these already, but looking at uh, some of the data on the state's website, 
You know, total rainfall has increased over the last 50 years. Storms have increased in intensity. Uh, winters are getting warmer and, and shorter, and summers are getting a lot hotter. hotter. Uh, hot. Well, I'll do that again. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Uh, but uh, I, I, I really like the cold, so I pay attention to that last one. But, uh, you know, in terms of risks, you know, um, we're already dealing with some of those risks, you know, in terms of the temperature swings and, and how they impact our farms. You know, rain, uh, increasing intensity there, more floods, um, and more uh, changing in terms of uh, in insecticide needs and pests, and it's, it's, it's a real problem. Our sugar season has already been uh, det uh, um, seen detrimental impacts. Uh, we uh, need more dollars for infrastructure, you know, uh, in terms of uh, disaster relief. Um, and uh, certainly it's going to impact snowfall. You know, when we wrote the report back in Clean Water in, in 2017, we pointed out that there was $2.5 billion in our uh, tourism industry. My guess is that it's, I haven't looked at it recently. I hope it's grown to about three. I hope it hasn't gone down. But the mitigation strategies it should be looked in terms of our economy, in terms of the loss of revenue, um, and, uh, and the cost of uh, disaster planning. So in disaster implement, uh, unfortunately, when we have a disaster, the implementation around that. So for me, this is a big effort. And um, uh, you know, we've done some work on, mit uh, we have a, um, a hazard mitigation report that the state has developed. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's very good. But it isn't there. It isn't, you know, to the final efforts. You know, on page 143 of that report, it says intends to create. We're still in that intend and moving forward part. Uh, we need to do more than just a hazard mitigation report. We need to be able to have a comprehensive full look at what we're doing. Now, I thought about that and said, if I, and I did this independently of looking at your bill. And I said, if I was looking at this, how would I start? And, uh, you know, I'd start with a uh, strategic plan, including goals and a comprehensive effort. Uh, you know, and, and one would be to develop those uh, climate goals um, and, uh, and strategies around them. We have done that, but we haven't, uh, we haven't done um, the work to make that happen. We need to develop an action plan, and that action plan needs to include regulations uh, uh, with requisite detail, uh, policies, and to create measurement and accountability plan to track these efforts and demand action. Uh, when, when those um, uh, goals and um, uh, strategies have not been met and our mission has not been met. Uh, when I look at your bill, I say it's doing that. And I'm very pleased to see that, you know, this is the strategy that we take uh, when we're addressing problems on the financial side. You're doing the same thing uh, in terms of this, uh, the, the broad issue of, uh, of, of climate risk. But while we've had efforts, again, we need to move forward on implementing a plan. Um, and I would also point out uh, one other piece on this. You know, it impacts us in so many ways. It impacts our farms, it impacts our, our sugar season, it impacts our tourism, it impacts costs for, for mitigation and costs uh, when we have disasters. Irene is a great example of that. Uh, but more importantly, or not more importantly, that's in itself a reason to do this, in of itself a uh, reason to do this. In addition to that, I want to point out that the rating agencies are now paying attention to this uh, with, with great interest. Uh, there are two publications here. Um, the first one is um, evaluating the impact of climate change on U.S. state and lo local issues. That was issued in 2017, um, and that, uh, mm -hmm. that document right on the, um, on the front, it says credit risks, are uh, credit risks are resulting from climate change. And the bottom line is that they want to know what mitigation strategies are in place how is the cash flow being affected? What is your energy plan to move forward? You know, after I ring, I won't say what rating agency, I got a call. And it was, uh, the questions were very succinct. How much does it cost? How are you going to pay for it? And can you still pay your debt service? Okay, was, uh, <laughs> okay? that's the bottom line uh, in the, as they're looking at it. On page three of the report, I believe, um, I wrote my, there you go, uh, you're taking a look at, uh, you know, pro the issues, property uh, tax, state sales tax, impact on tourism. On the other side, by the way, we did see some construction costs go up because of uh, Irene. Um, you know, increased cost of debt, if you have to issue more debt. Uh, right after Irene, I, I, I remember folks coming to me and saying, we've got to do a bond, we've got to do a bond, we've got to take care of these things. I won't relate that to another recent subject. But uh, taking a look at the balance sheet, you know, in terms of impaired assets that we have in the state, our cash flow and the ability to do that and the ability to pay debt. Rating agencies are interested in that. 
In 2019, there was a separate report uh, by Moody's. I think we have to hit that other button. There you go. And uh, it uh, it talks about uh, you know the risk uh, of temperature shifts and 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 precipitation patterns and how we're going to address those. Talks a little bit about uh, the demand for energy when you have higher temperatures and the disaster costs that are associated not just across the world but with the U.S. and as I said, we've seen in this state. Uh, they're serious about this, the rating agencies. S&P um, and Fitch have also weighed in on it. And Moody's has just recently taken another step. They bought uh, a majority share in a company called 24-7, I like the title. Uh, and this company uses uh, outputs from climate change models to assess physical risks associated with climate change. The processes and efforts that governments are use, uh, doing, in including, um, including state and local, as well as the uh, private sector. So why would Moody's take a, a majority stake in a, in a climate risk assessment company? And the bottom line is that they want to provide meaningful data on the governments and the financial community and investors, investors in this state, and it's not just bonds, but people who invest in this state, who come here to, 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 uh, to start companies. They want to know, um, you know what, what the risks are in climate change and what, uh, what we're doing. The people that are buying our bonds want to know what's going to happen in terms of the future and the future risks that might impair those bonds. I think we're in good shape on that, uh, just in case Moody's is listening. Um, but uh, the bottom line for me is this impact. The financial community is looking at these issues, and they're looking at how we're addressing climate change. Not just with broad goals, but how we're going to implement them, and how we're going to be accountable for them in moving forward. It's a material risk financially. It's a material risk uh, for governments uh, all across the country, um, and uh, the rating agencies are paying attention to this. Uh, and I think I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we use GDP for the state or GSP, whichever. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'd be curious to know, I, you said you hadn't really looked at the uh, um, tourism dollars, but uh, like maple skiing and farming sure. seem to be the, the three industries that immediately come to mind that yep. are most affected by the Absolutely. climate stuff. Um, I would be curious to know if we could, uh, if there was any way to calculate the delta between uh, where it, w it would be if we weren't uh, in this climate situation and where it is now. Like, how much are we losing as a result of it? Uh, that would take some modeling, which uh, we have not done. I have looked at the DEC site and others that have some very good information on the risk, just the areas that you've just mentioned, as well as the, uh, uh, the uh, hazard mitigation um, uh, report. And again, what I'm seeing is that uh, we need to do more modeling in that area to take a look at that. And I think that that's part of um, ultimately accountability in the end. Matt, thanks for coming. Uh, so one of my concerns in, in uh, listening to a lot of folks that come in and say how much they appreciate the bill, um, talking about uh, do more, invest more, action plan, all this. Um, my concern is I don't I don't see what those investments and costs are going to look like. They're kind of in a, in a blind area right now. Sure. And well, so what I what I mentioned too though is our other obligations, and I mentioned just a few the other day: pension obligation, um, half a billion dollars worth of unfunded school improvements that are out there in communities, the housing bond that you just spoke about that you didn't believe was. Uh, Reasonable in the sense of, I believe it was principal that would have to be paid back on that bond. Uh, the uh, the interest. Yeah, the, yes. just the interest. Yeah, okay. Um, so anyway, well, both have to be repaid, but the cost, the interest cost, is someplace between twenty six and thirty some odd percent, depending on the bond, um, and that's a pretty hefty amount of money. But with all those things in play, um, again, you, you know, can you put my mind at ease sure. as far as? Well, I think we, we talked about this in the Clean Water Report, and what we said is that uh, that the cost, I believe, was $2 billion, and that um, the unmet cost was someplace in, the, in a billion-dollar range, you know, with existing resources, and we needed to marshal those at the state and uh, local and private sector level. And the state uh, did some analysis, and we said we could we need to get up into that $50 million range per year to, um, to do this. Uh, we did some... Um, some effort at the front end to um, 
uh, to have a, a glide path to that in terms of um, um, using some bonding capacity that was still there uh, within our current geo obliga um, general obligation uh, debt capacity that's determined uh, through a uh, process with a really, uh, really incredible name, the Capital Debt Affordability Advisory Committee. It's a really wild meetings if you want to come. But, um, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, it's an important issue and how much debt can you have. Uh, we, we took a look at these issues. We ended up, uh, they weren't quite the revenues that we looked at uh, originally. Uh, uh, the governor um, and the General Assembly came up with some, some areas to do that. And we're pretty close to what that number is um, in, uh, in terms of making those changes. We also came up with delivery systems to make it work, to get those dollars out the door. And we also made some changes in our, um, in our uh, uh, definition of clean water so that more could be done at the bond bank and, um, and uh, uh, over at Vita in terms of uh, working with natural resource, uh, natural uh, resources and things like uh, riparian buffers and so on. So um, um, we were able to make a lot of changes because we took action. This is taking action. This is getting you on the, on the path to get that done. $2 billion, we found a way to do it over a 20-year period. We found a way because we had the desire um, and the will to make it happen. And I think that this bill gets you to that, gets you to the will to make it happen. And I think it's extraordinarily important. The risk in these areas, and, and again, you know, I haven't done the modeling. Um, we did it uh, for the water. Uh, we also had 26, uh, uh, was it 23 or 26? 23, 23 uh, stakeholder meetings with 1,000 people. I'm not suggesting I'm volunteering to do that again. Uh, but uh, uh, the reality is that um, we recognize the cost of doing nothing and standing down. You are in that same boat. The cost with Irene, the, you know, replicating those, replicating the, uh, the cost to, um, to our farms. You, talk, we talked about, you just talked about the sugar, uh, sugar rain season. I saw an article in Digger a few, um, a, I don't know, what was a few months back or a month. Time just kind of compresses when you folks start to come here. It just becomes one wild you know, series of time. It, yeah, it, it, it just, you know, there's no night and day anymore. It's just, you know, continuum. But, uh, but uh, sorry, I had to say it. Uh, but uh, for me, looking at those risks, you are going to have more costs by doing nothing. And you're going to impact sales tax. You're going to impact um, our, our, our tourism revenues. You're going to impact the cost of doing business for our farmers. Um, and, uh, and they have a tough enough job already. Um, and uh, for me, uh, inaction is not the, cho uh, not the, uh, the choice to make. I wholeheartedly support this, uh, this bill. So just yes. a follow-up, please. So would you recommend a similar modeling uh, effort? To, well, I think that that would be part of um, action plans that would be developed by the agencies to work forward on this. Um, uh, I, I certainly would be She's going to shoot me for um, uh, for rec volunteering again. I'd be You're happy right. to I'd be happy, yeah, I'd be happy to assist, but not take the lead. Okay, mm -hmm. but I would be happy to assist. It's been pointed out to me that, um, believe it or not, with legislation and statute and different, um, uh, I'm on 30 different um, boards and committees, and um, uh, obviously I send people to different different one. Um, uh, boards and committees because I can't be in 30 places at once, uh, but um, we're stretched a little thin, and I would point out that we haven't had, our budget right now in, the, in, the, in our general administration is actually less than it was in 2009, um, and uh, so we, we keep our belt, you know, the belt tightened there. Uh, we're, we're kind of coming up to the limit of what we can do, to be honest, uh, with additional programs, but we're willing to help. We're willing to help. This is important. And um, I see this as um, uh, one of the highest priorities the state can have. Paying the pensions and, uh, and long-term liabilities is kind of high on my list, too. But um, uh, this, is, this is important. Um, not doing anything is just the wrong thing to do. Okay, so I, I didn't want to step on your toes, and I'm glad you asked that follow-up question. I have a similar one, and um, I am curious. I for a lot of reasons, was not very involved in the in the water work that you had done a few years ago and continue today. Um, so it would be helpful for me to understand uh, what the analogy is between what was done there. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, the legislature I know and the state government struggled with that issue for years, yes. maybe decades. Yes. Uh, you know, back in the late 90s, we were talking about mm -hmm. clean water, and it took us 
you know, near on 20 years uh, to get there. Part of the thing that broke loose the logjam was your work on, you know, very specifically outlining what are some of the strategies, what are some of the financing pathways, um, so that we had clarity on some of that. Um, you know, it still took a couple of years to get mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, kind of yeah. get over the hump on how are we going to actually finance this. My question is, how clear the analogy is between that work and what we're contemplating here. I would say we've got to do this much more quickly because of the emergency at the end. But also, I see some of this work as, um, you know, cost savings in nature. Absolutely. If people are using less fuel, mm -hmm. if people are using more efficient technologies, you know, there's also discussion about the economic development component of this. There's some of that in the water world, but where is the analogy there? Sure. And I know that you undertook this study over months, if not. You know, it was a long time. Minute, it was a long time. If you can compress that sure. into five minutes. That, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, first I want to say that uh, while it said the Treasurer's <laughs> report, it was a combined effort yeah. with A and R, agriculture, economic development, um, lots of um, lots of private sector folks. That, uh, we brought in local um, <laughs> municipalities as well. It was a combined effort. Um, and we did analyze the cost uh, as, a, as, a, as a group, and I think that that's something that needs to be done. I think that part of that's been done already. There are studies on climate change. Yep. You know, we took those studies and we pulled those together, uh, and uh, uh, I think that some part of the regulatory or policy process moving forward would be to require something along that lines, at least compiling what you have and putting that into a strategic plan uh, that moves forward. I think the comprehensive energy plan um, um, lacks a little bit in terms of how to get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this would be this would be important. Um, so I think that's step number one. Um, I do believe that you've got to move faster. I would absolutely agree with you that this is not uh, something you could uh, do over a two, three year period. Uh, we need to do it now. Uh, the consequences are already hitting us um, in, in terms of, as I say, farming, sugar. Uh, 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 we can't take that chance. Um, when I did the clean water report, I made the analogy that clean water is, is an asset. And if you've got a company, and the company makes widgets, and I don't even know where the widgets are at. I don't think they actually exist, but I, you make widgets, okay? You make sure that the widget machine is working, okay? And that means you put investment into that machine. Because you can't make a profit if you don't, um, if you don't uh, keep the widget machine working. The same with clean water, the same with climate. Uh, change. You have to see that uh, our climate, not the, uh, our climate, is an asset. It affects all these areas. You have to invest in it, and I think the end result is it's cost effective. You mentioned jobs; it creates new jobs and new economies. And I think we've done a lot in solar. And we've got, <coughs> done a lot in wind. We've got some uh, um, some clear head starts in that area. New technologies um, are, are are there in terms of farming, in terms of um, of, um, of well go back to clean water for, you know, for a while, um, uh, uh, different types of digester technologies, those help create jobs. They also, as you said, when you're putting more, you know, you have um, uh, less energy being used. Oil is a pretty um, um, uh, up and down in terms of its, um, its reliability over time, uh, uh, prefer other sources of energy, frankly. Um, and uh, as soon as I mentioned oil, I said, boy, did I step in it. But, uh, but uh, those are the things that we want to get away from, okay? The technologies have to be there. Lowering our energy costs is good for homeowners. It's good for companies. It's good for people that are, that are trying to, to, it's an affordability issue, that are trying to uh, pay their bills. And those energy costs, you know, are really, really high, you know. And uh, so I think that there are cost-effective ways to do it and cost deterrence, that they're not going to have the cost for the types of disasters that we saw in Irene and other types of disasters that we've had since then. So I think it's a cost-effective model. See it as an asset uh, that needs to be monitored, needs to be invested in, and needs to be uh, cared for, because if we don't, uh, we lose so much uh, in this state. Okay. Um, Beth, this bill puts uh, the Agency of Natural Resources in, in the position of, of uh, being the lead agency, um, which seems appropriate in terms of it, as it being the lead agency also for controlling pollution. But, I was, but we've, had, we've heard from some people questions about whether 
um, whether that's really an effective structure because the agency is ANR is is a, is a one on a on a level with all, all the, with transportation and commerce and all, all the other agencies. <coughs> and I just wonder if, you, with your experience in state government, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think that uh, when going back to the analogy with clean water. Um, uh, ANR was our primary partner in working some of the bills out and coming up with legislation around the definition of clean water and the delivery systems uh, that uh, were, were uh, included in, um, uh, in in the final act. And I, I'm, I was trying to search for the number, the act number, and I, I'm not going to get there. But um, um, so I think that ANR is a good lead. I think that they have experience working with other um, other agencies and that cooperative approach. Uh, and uh, we had a lot of success uh, in dealing with them. I think that uh, Secretary Moore did a great job taking what we did in the report <coughs> and translating it into action. And um, I, I would um, uh, recommend, uh, I don't know what her workload looks like right now, but uh, you, <laughs> know, uh, you folks volunteered me for the, uh, for the clean water report. I'm volunteering her. <laughs> so, hey, she out there someplace? <laughs> yeah, I'm in real trouble. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Have I answered your questions? You did. Okay. You did. Well, you certainly answered mine. Um, yeah. okay. But go ahead. Honey. Sorry, just to follow up on your last answer, because um, this is one thing that's come up um, from a number of people if ANR is the right mm -hmm. um, place. And I guess I'm just curious with regard to clean water, it seems as though there was as complicated or, if not more, so, you know, a, a, a situation, but the inter connecting of so much wasn't there. It really was. I mean, it really is. Folks, I mean, there's certainly some stormwater transportation, you know, those, but it's, um, I mean, this has, ever, I mean, uh, I, I, I mean, this encompasses a lot more than the, the, those who would be involved in the clean water. Well, I think that we can build on that success, number one. But when I take a look at uh, what we did in clean water, we talked to everybody from uh, BGS, um, to um, uh, to transportation, uh, to um, to agriculture, um, to um, economic development. We talked to the private sector. Um, uh, we talked to farmers. So I would say that the breadth of that was pretty big. I'd say that the difference here is that you've got um, a shorter time frame to get this done because the the the, um, uh, the effects are more severe. Uh, they're related, obviously. But I think that ANR has the capacity. Um, or perspective to be able to do this. You know, I can't answer for their resources and, you know, in staff and, and what that's going to look like down the road. Uh, that's something that uh, they'll have to discuss. Um, but um, uh, what we found was um, that the ability to bring those other agencies, other partners into the conversation, uh, the capacity or the will to do that was, a, uh, was very clear in, in AR. I think they can do it again. I have a lot of trust in what the, the folks I worked with there was superb. Um, uh, they, they did a great job. Great. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The, the oxygen masks are going to drop down from the ceiling. <laughs> sure. no, 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 no. Okay. I might need to have the door open. Yeah. The door is open. Yeah, feel, feel free to open that door. Um, it's, open. Just, uh, it's open. It's open. It's open. It's open. It's open. We might need to really open. Laura, it's been mentioned that maybe your is that your person might be, yes. might, might be in uh, danger of falling out. That would so. be really upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just put it? Are you keeping it on the windowsill? Yes, I am. Right there. Yeah, it's, it'll be harder to fall out. <laughs> Mary, would you like to? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't quite see it. Yeah, I was back there. I was back there. Welcome. Thank you. We're, we're this crowded every day. Yeah. And actually, we're not. All right. <laughs> We've got an all star <laughs> cast in here this afternoon. Okay. So I thank, can't wait to hear that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the team. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have been discussing for the last couple of weeks um, H688, which is the Global Warming Solutions Act and um, taking testimony on that. Um, I really appreciate you coming over and joining us today for testimony. Uh, always interested in your perspective, but particularly as a, um, 
uh, a utility leader. Uh, in fact, Facts. utility yeah. <laughs> well, the utility that. executive of the year um, <laughs> in, in 2019. And um, certainly the perspective you bring there, but also just generally from, uh, from the private sector um, and dealing with these issues, you have certainly been a leader with Green Mountain Power in bringing that utility uh, into, the, into the 21st century in terms of um, actually both mitigation and resiliency work, um, kind of critical to that uh, business model. So thank you for joining us. We record our hearings for the record, so if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Sure, I'm Mary Powell. And uh, I think I'm listed as an energy leader and a small business owner, right? Yes. Woohoo! Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. I can be reached at mary at spotthedogvt.com. So there we go. What is Spot the Dog? <laughs> it's a company that I founded way back in 1994 uh, and that my husband uh, is the CEO of and has been for a decade. But uh, we're going through phenomenal growth because we were just put on Oprah Winfrey's list of favorite things. So oh. hmm. yeah, that nice. happened right as I was leaving Green Mountain Power. So I've been deep back in dogs, so it's awesome. Good. So, and they care about climate change too, good. so it's all good. good. <laughs> it's all connected. Good. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, is it Spot the dog, yeah, as in reflective, protective outerwear for dogs, and a world's first energy bar to be shared with your dog. So there's my commercial about the business. <laughs> now let's talk about matters important to you guys. So. Um, well, you know, primarily, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the um, bill in a, in a broad scope, or uh, you know. So we welcome your input on that, um, but as well. Um, uh, just, just generally, um, you know, your input uh, on that is welcome. Great. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to talk about this very important topic and this very important bill from my perspective. And I did have a chance uh, to read through it. Uh, and I'm glad that I can be here today because really all kidding aside about other things that might be happening or not happening in my life as a small business owner, um, there is really no topic probably that I'm more passionate about than uh, climate change, uh, both in terms of the sense of incredible urgency, I feel, that it's an, uh, an issue that uh, we need to tackle, we need to embrace, and we need to really move forward as fast as possible. Uh, but also, I, I look at it also from the perspective of a little bit of what, of, of what uh, Beth Pierce mentioned, which is, I think, you know, it is for the states, for the communities, for the entities that get ahead of the curve and want to embrace, well, I don't know that there's any ahead of the curve at this point, but that actually embrace it and move fast. I think there is incredible uh, economic opportunity over time uh, to be a leader, not a follower. So I think the time is, the time is of essence and we need to move forward. So um, I'm pleased to be here. I read it, I mean, so probably with those words, none of what I will say will surprise you. So um, A, we need goals. No, we actually need requirements. requirements. <laughs> yes, we need to move from goals to have hard, fast requirements, commitments to what we want to accomplish. We need to do it, in, in my view, with as little bureaucracy as possible. Um, and we need to do it in a way that uh, is not about uh, setting up a structure to allow lawsuits to get us to the change that we want to see. Um, simply because, not that I actually think that that approach actually might have worked in certain areas in decades past. I think we are way past the time when that approach is useful from a societal perspective because I think it takes too darn long. So I think it's fundamentally flawed uh, because really what we need is action. And uh, you know, playing things out in courtrooms does not tie very well in my experience to moving quickly and action. So I think uh, you know, I'm all in on really having very rigorous uh, requirements of what we want to achieve and as fluid, flexible, and fast-moving structure around that to move forward. Um, I also worry a little bit, so on those, so the parts I would worry a little bit about are, you know, in my experience, both deep in the nonprofit world, as well as three and a half years working for state government and the private sector, you know, I really subscribe to when you have more than a group of about 12, um, you are going to slow things down considerably. So I worry a lot about the size of 
uh, the group that I saw that was going to possibly be leading this forward. Um, you know, I think there's a way to have lots of people involved without having um, these huge task force that are become so large and people substitute people and at the end of the day not a lot gets happened but there's a lot of paperwork on why nothing happened in my experience so um, we don't have time for that and we don't want that so I would say those those are my overarching um, observations and comments and happy to yeah. answer questions the, the last point was is interesting to me um, looking at what other states have done from a modeling perspective I don't know if they're good models models or not, but, um, you know, New York, being New York, had uh, scores and scores of people uh, working on, you know, what was moving forward. Uh, Maine, I think, had uh, in the neighborhood of 40 people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a group of legislators who had worked on drafting this, I think, were particularly sensitive to that point. And uh, so it's certainly well taken. This group has, uh, I believe, 21. Yep. So um, uh, smaller, but you know, still larger than. Uh, and in fact, we heard testimony this morning that um, you know, who's missing? Uh, you know, more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and there it's, always it's is. A, Guess what? If you have 25, there's going to be 50 missing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, so to me, it's just: do we have a bias for action, or do we have a bias for process? Yeah. And um, a bias for process is a lot safer. <laughs> it's yeah. what. Um, you know, you see it in the private sector, you see it in nonprofits, you see it in government all the time. Um, it's way safer. I don't yep. think we have time to be focused on what is safer. I think we need to be focused on action. Um, and so that's, you know, and I also, I'm a really just deep in my bones. I'm one of the areas I have a lot of excitement, and actually I've had a lot of reason over the last few weeks to have even more excitement is the area of new technological development in the clean energy economy. In fact, I've been really shocked, honestly, at the fire hose of phone calls and uh, things I've been invited to <coughs> since I left Green Mountain Power um, from players, from financial players, I would say, all over the country. I think there is, there is, I don't think, I know there is more capital and investment going in private equity, going into the clean energy economy than I have <coughs> ever seen before. So I think that's really good. That gives me a lot of hope. But then that also, it also, worry might not be the right word, but how do you marry that with kind of a, what feels like maybe a very bureaucratic approach yeah. to solving the problem, which is we're gonna figure it out yeah. and we're gonna have a plan. And change doesn't really happen that way in my <coughs> mind. It's very, very concrete deliberate, we are going to get here by then, right? And then really creating momentum and entrusting a number of folks, no more than 12, yeah. <laughs> to work with a lot of others, right? Because again, you can't get anything done without a thousand conversations. So each of those 12 needs to have a thousand conversations. But, um, you know, and then really moving forward. You know, we know where our problems are. I mean, that's the cool thing, you guys. I mean, I read it like it's, it's, transportation, it's heat, like we know. It's so we, what we really have to have is the courage and the bias for action. So let me ask you on that point, as, as, a, uh, as a utility leader, um, and I think utilities don't have the reputation as being the most dynamic uh, part of the American economy. Right. Um, but as you're looking forward, you know, in terms of 10-year capital plans, and thinking of the transformation that Green Mountain Power has gone through in the last 10 years, um, again, when you're looking forward 10 years, you don't know what technologies are coming down the road in year mm -hmm. you know, six and seven and eight, and yet uh, you're creating capital plans, you're creating strategic plans um, to try and get to a certain place. How do you deal with that uncertainty as you're you know, looking ahead to whether it's renewable goals right. or decarbonization? Well, and, and there's a little bit of, I mean, sorry. The Dilbert of leading a regulation. <laughs> so you, by definition, have to do these longer-term things that you file. That you know, really, from my perspective, hopefully you don't spend a lot of time obsessing about. And actually, most of everything we on the ground tried to focus on when I was there was what are the things to do in the next two years, right? Because, and that's my point. You can't sit here today to me and chart out. Or you could. You could. You could chart it out and you'll be so wrong because it's, it's 
you're not allowing room for how things might change. So again, I love I use the storage example as a great example of that. Like we didn't have any plans, strategic plan that said we're gonna get into storage, right? We had we created a culture and a and a requirement that we were gonna move in a certain way, right? And we cared a lot about not just climate uh, lowering carbon, but we cared a lot about improving resilience, mm -hmm. you know, for the customers that we serve. So when we heard about this, we just jumped on it. Right, and then that then became really the cornerstone of so much of what we did strategically. So, yeah. I mean, one of the first things I did when I joined the industry was I threw out the strategic plan because I actually I think that's these three to five year plans don't make a lot of sense in the modern economy. There's requirements that you have, so, you know, these IRPs yeah. and the DDEs and the blah blah blahs. But you know, then you actually have how you run your company and how you seize opportunity with crystal clarity on goals and measurements, so you know if you're moving towards those. Yes. And that, I think that's one of the challenges state government has, or any government. Yeah. Uh, it, but we heard testimony earlier this week about um, actually someone who's working with a group moving, helping to move Maine forward to, and it was a, it was a note of caution, but also optimism of leaving room for market solutions that we don't know, uh, you know we don't know exactly what those right. are yet. But they're there, right. and they're going to develop. And Moore's law has, yeah. uh, you know, a, 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 a part of this process. Right. So. Right. And yet we also know, you know, we have, you know, what, six hundred and twenty thousand of us, right? And we also know that the transformation we've started is tiny compared to where we have to go. You know, so there is also room to be said we should be, you know. In fact, I when I got utility executive of the year, you know, on the one hand, it's nice. On the other hand, you know, honestly, I felt like it's kind of sad that the progress we've made is seen as this national example, when literally we have maybe 1,500 homes that now have dramatically improved resilience. So how do we get this team, you know, that's going to enact what you're talking about to focus on making that 20,000 by next year. Like even if, just like, just figure that out, which actually shouldn't be hard. Um, you know, or how do we get from the level of EVs we have to X, you know, and, and know then that you're measuring that and you're making this, this great progress. So, so while we leave room for new technologies, we can also really, really develop much faster the existing ones that we have and have them in more homes and businesses. Effectively. Yeah. Mary, uh, you know, uh, the chair had mentioned uh, new technology playing into this as well, it, you know, how and, and if it should. Uh, I sat up last night thinking about uh, this as well. As you can see, we have a board with numerous bills on it. Uh, I thought last night another concern of mine is going to be uh, holding back this body, the legislative body, from enacting all these other things around it. And, and maybe some of them would be good. Will they be included in the, in the overall plan? Uh, I don't know, but I mean, you know, it's everything from, you know, you got people out there pushing for 100% renewables by 2030. I mean, you and I know that's, that's not gonna happen. Well, I, you might not. I, I, I might, I'm not so sure I agree with that. I think that could happen. I think it, I think it could happen. Yeah. Well, again, I, I wanna see, I wanna see that, yep. that, that plan, that, you know. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, I mean, it, there's Act 250 that's being proposed, that yep. has all, uh, all kinds of implications. So I think it's, it's kind of a, uh, we're working at, at both ends here, and um, I, I just don't know how, how good an idea that is either. I mean, because I know this body well enough to know that, you know, it all depends on who's here, but what they're going to push for um, even further than, you, you know, may look like they're moving too slow, so let's put this in. And whether that's going to be part of meeting that goal, Maybe that's something we need to talk about too. If something that the legislature does above and beyond what the commission sets forth, right, and, and agency of natural resources promulgates through rules, is that going to be counted? Is that, is that going to be also included in uh, that goal reduction uh, effort? It's a concern for me, yeah. for me a big concern. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, it's, it's and, not. And, it's and as far as, you know, I understand renewables, but. You know, I'm from Lowell, you know that, yeah, about the wind project up there. Yeah. And, and I, I guarantee you, you try to get another wind project in, and you know, you're looking at 15 
$1.5 million now to get new transmission right. line to get even use the power. Right. So, you know. Well, that's let's remember, I mean, one of the really cool things we have going for us in Vermont is we already have an electric supply that is pretty darn clean and low carbon. I mean, Green Mountain Power's existing portfolio today, which is, what, 78% of the state, is 90% carbon free. You know, I, in fact, I mean, if you see the Energy Action Now dashboard, electricity is the one area where we've actually met or are exceeding all the goals. So again, I think part of our, because we're used to it, it's how we've thought for decades, I think, in Vermont. Every time we have this conversation, I think we quickly go to the electric supply. You know, personally, I think the electric supply is doing darn well. It is the other areas. How do we help advance technological advancements where, again, if we use strategic electrification, we could actually help keep rates lower into the future. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is Green Mountain Power's rates have gone up below the rate of inflation over two decades. I don't know any other part of government or anywhere in the state where that has been true under the rate of inflation. So you have a pretty green, affordable supply. So a lot of how we tackle the goals we have are, you know, a lot of it is in transportation, it's in heating, and yes, in agriculture too, right? But you, you already have, so I don't, I don't think it's about that debate anyway. I mean, there might be more wind projects, there might not. There, you know, certainly you're gonna see, I think, more solar and storage because it helps with resilience. I think of that a lot. Laura, when I think of conversations we've had where those kinds of projects can be so helpful in creating microgrids, creating really community home and business-based solutions uh, so that when these climatic events happen, we have more Vermonters who can go on with their lives who don't have the insecurity of having no power. But other than that, I mean, not to say that electric supply shouldn't continue to march forward, but it's out of every area it's doing the best. Well, it's not without irony that we have requirements in that yeah. area, and those have been established sure. in the last five years. Sure. Uh, they're sure. probably but some went ahead of those yep. I mean you know I mean WEC has been a hundred percent for a while and you know Green Mountain Power launched a goal that was to jump ahead of the requirement right so so I think a, a bit of both but you're right it, you know does it get inspired by having you know legislative uh, requirements and goals it sure does yeah well to kind of follow up uh, you know to me I, I agree with you that we're, we're at this level of of uh, a great amount of renewable already, whatever. But now we're looking at an infrastructure issue. And we heard that from Massachusetts as well. Uh, you know, they're looking at 3,200 megawatts of wind off the coast now. Yeah. But they're looking to try to get uh, some of the hydro down to Massachusetts. Right. So, so that's going to be huge with investments in that. And where's that coming from? The ratepayers. Yeah. So, you know, that's those are the sort of things that, you know, I have to visually see in a sense even if they're estimates or mm -hmm. and they may change along the way because of other um, issues, but uh, uh, that's, that's some of my concern anyway. Any other questions for, for Mary? Is that a slight technical one? Um, with regards to resiliency, uh, if you don't know, maybe you could point me in the right direction. Uh, of the uh, number of hours outages per year or whatever. Um, is there records on how many of those are caused by upstream of the transformer, or, sorry, uh, uh, substation versus downstream? Oh, there is absolutely records, I think, relative to outages that you could get from all the companies as to exactly what created them. So, you know, tree-related, where located, yeah. Um, the, the, the major ones, though, that really shake uh, or shook our customers to the core are, you know, again, the big major events that come in uh, that really knock down infrastructure both on both sides of the substation and knock down, uh, you know, that is, you know, again, actually, you know, if you look at just core reliability, like the day-to-day -day reliability, um, you know, the Vermont stats stand up very well against, certainly against any rural state. I mean, just day-to-day -day reliability stats in Vermont are really good. So I think there's been adequate attention and investment across the board, um, but it is it is those major climatic events. And that was a lot of what informed me so many years ago when I was out working a storm, oh, probably 12 years ago. And, you know, I saw lines that we had just rebuilt to make hardy, better wire, storm, right? You know, and when Mother Nature comes through, you 
know, it's twigs and twine. That's when I came up with that expression because I was like, oh my goodness, it all becomes twigs and twine. I mean, just we saw that with the 1998 ice storm. I mean, Hydro Quebec's massive transmission yeah. towers became twigs and twine. So, you know, that's a huge part of what we need to be planning for and thinking about at the same time is how do we have our climate, our overall climate solutions be ones that are cost effective reliability solutions for Vermonters we know are fragile right now. We should be doing more of those projects faster. You know, those are the types of projects we should be doing much faster that also would tie to the goals of this bill. Mike and then Heidi. Yeah, um, <clears throat> when Green Mountain Power said it wants to get to 100% carbon free by 2025, um, carbon free doesn't necessarily mean renewable, right? Right. And that includes uh, nuclear? Right. And so uh, when those nuclear plants eventually go offline, what would you say should replace those? Well, so just, uh, just to back up for one second, um, <coughs> we, we said 100% carbon free by 2025, 100% renewable by 2030. So okay. the whole point was to have, and that's what we did way back in 2008 when we launched our strategy to go low carbon, cost effective, incredibly reliable. It was always about using the benefits of existing nuclear as a bridge to, uh, to a much cleaner, greener portfolio. So yes, so that has always been, so I, you know, I, I think there's an expectation, again, I'm not there anymore, so I'm not speaking on behalf of the company, because goodness, a lot could have changed just even in a few weeks. But, um, uh, but you know, it, it, a lot of it is you know taking advantage of some technologies that we know are there now, um, solar and storage, really leveraging storage, but also room in that again for uh, the advancement of other uh, developments. And in fact, you know, the expectations on some of that offshore wind that's supposed to happen in the region over the next decade. Uh, is supposed to be very cost effective. So there was room for maybe having some of that, obviously seeing much more in-state uh, transition to self-supply. I think we're gonna continue to see more and more Vermonters wanna move to particularly, in my mind, the solar storage paired together because it's, it's uh, not only can they get you know, more energy independence, but they also can get then the resiliency benefits. Right. Um, thanks, Mary. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, so um, I just want to go back to your um, push. Uh, we need action. We need a process to, you know, action and things take a while. Um, and in the business sector, as we know, um, that's much easier. Mm -hmm. You can just it is. make a decision and roll with it. Um, in this particular, uh, as I said earlier, to you know, to Scott, you know, dictatorships are really efficient. Uh, I think you were quoted right, so right, right. on that. I think you were quoted on that. I was? Yeah. Oh. Um, so, uh, so I guess that's my kind of, in your experience, and you've had a lot um, throughout the years with, with this particular building outside, you know, this yeah. kind of thing. Um, and what I worry about is us, um, uh, we have this process in place or the, uh, with this bill. Um, what I worry about is us not really being responsible for doing the policy making that it goes to the executive branch. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I just wonder, I, 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 I'm just, I wonder what your thoughts are. And I'd, I'd like to see if we can, uh, I'd like to see if we can come to a place where we're actually, as elected officials, as people elected by the people of, of Vermont doing, um, Making these decisions once the plan comes, you know, comes into comes to fruition uh, in the, after the, and I just wonder. I know that there's some concern that um, politically it might be difficult or what have you, and it might um, uh, it might take more time um, than and more time than than what we have in, in a lot of, in a lot of, in the future of a lot a lot of people. So I'm wondering what. And then, of course, it goes to the judiciary. You know, if, if right. it doesn't, so right. so we're kind of saying, okay, the executive, and then the executive, if that doesn't work with the cause of action, um, um, we would go to the judiciary. So I'm just sort of wondering what. Right. I mean, if you have the confidence that we'd be able to do it as a legislator. I mean, I, you know, body. I think at the end of the day, anything. 
first of all, thank goodness it is a democracy, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and I and and again, the the work that I've had the good fortune of being a part of, you know, also was not work that you could do by fiat. You know, what I mean, it, yeah. and it's no good work, in my opinion, actually is right. Good work is hard. Like to do really good things is hard by definition, um, and so. You know, so and to do things, I think you know one of the greatest things Vermont has going for it. And I know we don't all feel this way on some days, but we are small enough to collaborate. We are small enough to figure out how to do stuff. That you know, I, I actually think that is our superpower when we when we lean into it. Um, you know, and that you know, so as much as you can head in a direction, that's that pushes towards that superpower that you know and again you know and that's probably and I don't I don't I don't have your ex, your collective experience right I have mine so I don't I can't lay out exactly how I think you would do it but that's why I sort of oh, like I you know it like legal strategies then breed fear and then that breeds more bureaucratic process so how does it really become something that you know in my mind just again thinking out loud it's so crystal clear you know what you want to see happen and yeah and then there's a way to bring it back but have enough involvement um, so that it's really building on the Vermont superpower of collaboration I, I, I really that's you know and 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 yet action I mean so again that's you know in some of the things that I think back on you know some of the hardest things I was a part of doing you know it was the vast majority wanted it we wanted to move quickly, um, you know, so we had to have a way to really continue to focus on how to collaborate, how to have a thousand conversations. So, but have a smaller, I would say for me, a smaller, tighter, accountable group. 180 people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. How many stuff you know, it's just a lot. We each have to have a thousand conversations too. I was all, I've been oh. part of so many and it's so it's it's you know, and we all have, right? And 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 sometimes you claim victory and then you say to yourself a few years later, Wow, should we really? Like, oh gosh, like I always just automatically just think of like cost of the intellectual and the emotional time of all the folks involved and you know you you want to have it you want to have it if you have it large too that the, you know my experience then nobody feels account like oh if I can't make it well Tim can be there just you lose the judge yep. if that's a technical term you want to be on it I'll try to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's it's I can do my fear uh, no. <laughs> So my question is a little bit a little bit off topic, but it's around broadband and it's around what you think uh, the convergence of, of broadband and electric utilities might be. Um, and so one of the things that we, we did last year and we, we've been working on, some of us have been working on since, is these communications union district as, a, as an avenue for getting broadband out. And one of the things that in my mind has been, well, maybe actually 10 years from now, it's going to be your electric utilities who are, who are really using broadband and are really the the vehicle for getting broadband delivered. So I, I, since since we have you here, I wondered if I could just ask you to <laughs> well, yeah, you're here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, my, I guess, you know, you'll probably get a very unsatisfying answer, which is just in a broad way. I mean, I feel like it, it goes back to what I just said. I feel like, yeah, there is absolutely power in collaboration. I think if there was a silver bullet to figuring out broadband, it would have been figured out Definitely five years ago, ten years, right? So it's well, but it's are a these tough are these industries converging? I guess, and and is is your is your crystal ball that you left back? I mean, I see more. Of, you know, I, I I see, you know, one of the things I share, I know, with all of you is the passion around how do we, how do we really make a rural economy prosper at a time when technological advance is actually increasing the great divide. So I see, you know, when I think out five and 10 years, no, my struggle has always been like, what? Like, there's gonna be solutions for communications connections that aren't grandpa's, that aren't right, exactly. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, how, how do we get to that kind of future in a way that, that can work in a rural economy, which is so, right. which is so different? So, so there's a fear I have of, when you say that, of like, oh boy, 
wow, that's like doubling down on the utilities becoming the fair points of the future because they're going to have all the like losing businesses. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like because because people will be well, no, but it's you know because again, our our whole philosophy was lean into technological advance, be part of that, be part of providing self-supply, right? Because you know, other, there's other parts of the world where you could see where literally poles and wires will just be really what landlines are of today, right? So, so I don't think it's the, I don't think there's a simple solution. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit of, bit of everything, but technologically, I absolutely think there's going to be leapfrogs past that. I mean, that's my own personal. Well, opinion. the connection to me was was the yeah. was the microgrid and the yeah. interactive, uh, you know, generation and 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 uh, load and right. you know right. and, and the necessity for 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 broadband to make that work. Absolutely, and that's why absolutely I think again our superpower could be so much more collaboration yeah. because I think you know there's so many tight rules of the road as you all know in the utility space, which is whatever. I guess that's the way it's supposed to be. But it doesn't, you know, how, how, do you, how do you really build in mechanisms to incent deeper collaboration so that any time there's one thing happening, you could stack public benefits around resilience or stack public benefits around communication. So I think there are, there are absolutely ways that, that progress could be made. With no so we give the last question yeah. to Robin. Oh. Um, so I, uh, so I want to go back to your earlier comment about uh, a bias for process versus bias for action, and that this this plan is not an action plan. It's a holding the steps to get to yep. an action plan. Yep. Um, but I, and and then I also tie that and want to tie that in with Mark's comment um, about. You know, so a big transmission line, the, the one that's permitted through Vermont is a billion dollars, I think, and, and we go, holy shit, that's, you know, that we can't, we can't do that. But, so my, my what I'm looking for is, is, what are the barriers that a billion dollars spread over that many kilowatts over 40 years is probably, could be cheaper than on-site generation of natural gas to, to build this distribution uh, a transmission system to bring in power from Canada. And we throw up these hurdles in our way, in our own way, and say we can't do it. And I'm just wondering your insights on those. My insights hurdles. about like big solutions versus small solutions. I mean, and, and also self sabotage, where we look at a hurdle, but we don't look behind it. We look at that hurdle and say, oh, we can't do it. Yeah, I mean, I do think that, you know, one of the phenomenons I think is happening from a societal perspective is, again, and we've seen it in our, all of our technologies, everything, right, we're moving towards more, we're moving towards smaller, faster, right, and I think bigger infrastructure is getting harder and harder to build and get done. I mean, I think that's, that's just a fa and I, that's true actually all over the globe. Um, uh, you know, so it's not, we're not alone in that. So, you know, much of what I've seen over the my years of experience, one of the challenges has been sometimes what is said that a, like, a big solution that could be more cost effective, right, could cost. What I have seen over my decades in this business is they never actually end up costing that because it's, a, it's originally, it's originally pitched with the idea that there won't be a thousand obstacles between mm -hmm. how it could be done and how it's actually going to get done. So, so I I don't have any I, I don't doubt that there will be continue to be larger solutions. Um, but at the same time, again, what you're seeing is technological advances in really where I see society moving more and more towards, which is individualized solutions for them. So that. That is happening all over the globe, and I don't see anything stopping that. So again, from a big picture, helicopter view perspective, I always use the landline cell phone analogy, right? So there were people decades ago that thought, well, no, the, the vast majority will still be using that. And what's, I see what's going to happen in the energy space is very similar. So you won't be tearing down that infrastructure. You're still going to need it. And a lot of people are still going to want to be grid connected, but they're not going to be using it as their primary source. So, um, so I think that does call into question 
doesn't mean the larger project shouldn't happen. It just calls into question how effective they will be over time from a cost perspective. Thanks. Great. Thank you okay. for joining us today. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's good yeah, to see everyone. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. <coughs> Good afternoon. Yeah, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, thanks, see you for, all. thanks for joining Hi, us. Heidi. Hi, Heidi. It's my pleasure. I always love listening to Mary. <laughs> I can't disagree with anything she said, so maybe I should just cut my testimony short. No, I, I think this is actually the first time you've been to our committee, at least since I I've been here. I believe it is. Yeah, but, um, and uh, I know you've been in this building at a moment, but maybe not as a palatial uh, uh, committee room as ours. So I know. Usually they're a little smaller, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you were, as I was saying the other day, if you were in Senate Ag, yes. Um, that might be a good one. So, um, Wynn, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, I, I don't necessarily have an introduction other than to say we've been working for a couple weeks on H688, which is the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and I know that you, uh, uh, I, so thank you for coming to offer thoughts on this. I know that you are um, bringing a few different perspectives here. One is a, um, you know, a Vermont uh, business person who um, is in a, involved in a very key industry in our state that has some you know climate things that are of, of interest and I know that you're also involved with the nature conservancy and, um, and uh, we've had some folks uh, uh, provide testimony as well so um, just by way of introduction thank you for being here and if you can introduce yourself for the record because we uh, we record our hearing. absolutely so thank you very much uh, I'm Lynn Smith I'm a resident of Warren Vermont and I'm actually coming here as you, you mentioned wearing two hats one is the president of Sugar Bush Resort up until two weeks ago. I was actually the owner of Sugar Bush Resort. Congratulations, thank by you the very way. Much for 18 years, but also a trustee of the uh, Nature Conservancy of Vermont. I'm going to give you my written testimony, uh, so I don't necessarily want to read that. A little redundant, but I hope you'll read it. Yep. But I'd like to just paraphrase it and, and talk about you know, what I think are some of the, the substantive issues I see as a business person, but also as a conservationist and a, a member of the Vermont uh, Nature Conservancy. Um, you know, obviously, I think everybody here knows the importance of winter sports, the ski industry, <coughs> the impact we have on the state. If you don't, Molly Mahara is right there, president <laughs> of VSA, and I'm sure she'll share the statistics. And also, you know, that we're facing, and I'd like to refer to it as climate change. This is something I actually learned from my new owners, and I refer to it as a climate crisis. And maybe that gets to Mary's point about actually creating more urgency, if you think it was a crisis and not just a change. So I'd like to, you know, really change the dialogue and talk more about the, uh, the climate crisis. You know, I've seen it in my long career, and I spent 28 years <coughs> in an advanced degree, I saw a lot of industries. And I saw a lot of industries and companies that failed to recognize trends and change. They sat back, they used a strategy of hope as a method which never works, and they went obsolete. I saw other industries that represented change, and they had the courage to actually embrace change and with change see an opportunity, even though there might have been a short-term cost to it. And that's the difference, I think, between you know, a winning strategy and a failing strategy. And maybe, you know, it's, it's very relevant to what we're seeing today. And I think the other thing, too, is we, we all know that what we do in Vermont is minuscule, right, for the, the climate crisis we're, we're facing. You know, the carbon that's, that's put out by coal in the United States, by India and China, you know, it's just massive. So what we do here isn't going to solve the climate crisis. But I do think it's important that we take a leadership role for a number of reasons I'll get into, and that we really you know, embrace the fact that we can do something and that cumulatively little steps do make a difference over time. So at Trigwish, just to give you an example of what we have been doing, and I sent you a copy of the Valley Reporter that I think really summarizes what we've been doing. We've been trying to focus on a number of things like energy efficiency. We've been focusing on supporting renewable energy, especially solar development, you know, installation of electrical vehicle, stations, development of energy efficiency buildings, and use of LED lighting wherever we can. So I think those are small steps, but they're important steps, and they're things that we can do that I think make a difference. And with the help of Efficiency Vermont over the last number of years, we've actually reduced our energy consumption by 34.5%. That's a big number. That's relevant. You know, not only is that good for the economy, I don't know that it makes Mary that happy, <laughs> but actually it does, but you know, it's also good for our business because we've reduced that cost of our business, so therefore we have a margin to spend on other things, and I'm going to get into what we're going to have to, to spend. But just to give you a little idea about energy, 
and a little bit of a tutorial on snow making. When I bought Trigbush in 2001, we had five, 6,000 cubic feet per minute compressors to make snow. In addition to that, we used to have to import for a period of time diesel generators in order to make snow at less than capacity. So because of the energy efficiency we have today, we currently only use two compressors, one at Lincoln Peak, one at Mount Ellen, that both use less than 4,200 CFM. So think of that energy savings that we've done, and that resulted in that 34% uh, reduction in actual kilowatt usage. So the actual, if you want to talk about kilowatt um, reduction, it's actually 5 million kilowatt hours that have been reduced, 5 million kilowatt hours that represent that 34.5%. In addition to that, I mentioned we have worked on solar development, uh, in particular Green Mountain, or Green Lantern, and we've developed so far five solar fields that are producing 2.5 megawatts of electricity. And the net metering has really allowed that, so they've been using our net metering. We get some cost benefit out of it, but it's really been a, a tremendous benefit, I think, for solar. In addition to that, we're working with Green Lantern and Mad River Solar on three other solar sites, one of which would be actually one of our parking lots at, at Sugarbush. Uh, currently, we've also installed 22 electrical vehicle charging stations at Lincoln Peak and Mad Ellen, and we have two additional charging stations in our Claybrook Hotel. So obviously, we're trying to encourage and motivate the use of electrical vehicles. And then I think importantly, this is where I think, you know, being a small state actually can be an advantage to some degree. Uh, we've made a decision that we want to become more outspoken advocates for climate action. Uh, mostly through our own public messaging as well as supporting the right organizations. So last year we became a top tier sponsor of Protect Our Winners. And if you're not familiar with them, it's really worth looking. It's a group of young athletes that have a great following young, among the younger generation. And we've also become an increased sponsor of 1% for the planet. Personally, I'm becoming much more involved with um, the Nature Conservancy here in Vermont and other environmental initiatives. And our new owner, Artella Mountain Company, is really is a leader in the ski industry. Their affiliate Aspen has been outspoken, they've been a leader, and I think we're gonna learn from them about what we can do even more. And I already mentioned, you know, just the, the change of mindset from talking about climate change to a climate crisis really came from David Perry at Altera. Now, why are we doing this? Well, obviously we're doing it for a lot of reasons, but I think a very important reason is because our guests want it, especially the younger generation. Increasingly, people ask us, you know, what are you doing about climate change? If you don't have a good answer, they don't wanna spend their money here. So from Vermont, you know, we want people to realize that we're taking action. We want the next generation to realize that we are being responsible. And we want them, frankly, to spend their money here instead of somewhere else. So there is an ESG initiative to this as well. But let's talk a little bit about climate change, because often I get asked questions. Are you seeing less snow? And they're assuming I'm gonna say yes, and I say no. Are you seeing a shorter season? They're expecting I'm gonna say yes, and I say no. So that's not happening, and it could lead you to the conclusion, well, climate change isn't happening, it's not affecting the ski industry, but that's totally wrong. So here's where we are seeing the, the impact, and it's significant. We're seeing it in the greater volatility of the weather. And last week was a great example. We were 100% open, we had great skiing. Suddenly we have 50 degree weather, rain, we're down to 50%, we're going into the all important Martin Luther King weekend. We lucked out. You know, we had enough snow making temperatures to make good snow, we had enough natural snow, we're almost 100%, and we had a record day in our history. Most ski resorts did. Now, had that not happened, had that not luck happened, what would have happened? We would have been down considerably, the tax revenue of the state would have been down in sales and use of rooms and meals, so it would have had a pretty significant impact. So, volatility, you know, we've already experienced this season five roller coaster events. We've had Good conditions, a thaw, rain, freeze. So we all know we've had January thaws forever. You know, that's that's not unusual, but to have five at this point in time, and unfortunately maybe six this coming weekend, mm -hmm. that is not the norm. That is unusual. So what does it mean for us? Well, it means that this volatility weather is causing us to really make investments. You ask the question of, you know, how do you look in the future? How do you plan? Well, we have to plan to get ahead of the curve of climate change. We have to invest now, we have to spend. So how are we spending money? Sometimes it's not the way I'd want to spend it. For instance, last summer, we had to bury some power lines. For 60 years, we've had power lines going from our base area to mid-mountain to generate our snowmaking and our lifts. But increasingly, we're seeing such great risk with the winds. If a tree comes down in the middle of Martin Luther King, I lose power, that's a disaster. 
So I had to spend $400,000 to bury those power lines. That's not productive. There's no ROI on that. That's insurance, but it's necessary to get ahead of the curve. Um, wind probably scares me more than anything else. I wake up in East Warren, I hear the wind, and all I can see is a tree falling across that power line. Several years ago, uh, the busiest day we ever had at Sugarbush was right after that um, Valentine's Day storm, four feet of snow, perfect conditions. Saturday was a bluebird day, 20 degrees. Every seat on all 16 chairs were filled and the power went out. So you talk about a disaster. Now fortunately we have a backup plan, we have diesel engines, you know, you can get everybody off in about an hour. But when a tree sways, that's what I worry about. And we're seeing increased volatility, not just in the winter, but in all seasons. I had lightning strike my Remount Express lift last summer. It's still being repaired. We're still trying to problem solve how to get it repaired. It's working because we have diesel backup, but that's not ideal. But that volatility of the weather is really, really important. The other thing we are seeing because of the volatility is the more winter thaws happen. And I just saw driving here the ice flows that are beginning to, to create on Winooski. You know, ice jams are, are very concerning to us. The way we make snow is we have a snowmaking pond, we withdraw from the Mad River when it's at the February mean level or above. And we put in a weir or a dam in November, it's taken out in March. But if you have a thaw, you have an ice jam, if that takes that dam out, again, we're out of snowmaking. Already it has damaged the foundation. We've repaired it somewhat, but we're going to have to invest another million dollars to put in a new dam, which is going to be an inflatable dam. So if the ice jams come down, we can deflate the dam, they go by, we can reinflate it. Mm -hmm. Now, do I want to spend that million dollars? No, but I have to, because again, you know, that's insurance. And then long term, because we experienced <coughs> something devastating with Irene, you all know of all the devastation around the state, but you may not know, we actually lost our snowmaking pond. So what happened? Snowmaking pond. Snowmaking pond. Snowmaking pond. So we have a pond next to the Mad River. So the water came in, it washed out the upstream. The river flowed in, it stopped, and it was filled with silt. Fortunately, it happened that date, because if it happened two weeks later, we would not have had a repair to open the season. We just barely got it done, removed, at an uninsured cost of a million dollars. So again, you look at weather volatility, those are the impacts it can have on a business like this. And then speaking of snowmaking, it's always been important in the East to have adequate snowmaking, and we're really fortunate in Vermont. I think we have the best as an industry anywhere in the country. We've been ahead of the curve. We have good, robust, we've been aided by efficiency Vermont. You know, all of us are doing what I mentioned to you that we're doing at Sugarbush, but it's not gonna be enough for the future. Because with greater volatility, there's gonna be shorter windows of really good snowmaking, weather and opportunities. We have six thaw freezes. We've gotta recover quickly especially before those all-important weekends. So what that means is we're going to have to invest in a long-term strategy of creating some more snowmaking capability at certain moments of time. For us, that means most likely building another reservoir at a substantive cost higher up in the mountain. So if the Mad River washes out, we've got a reserve, but also allow us to put more snow out at any given time. Not necessarily making more snow over the course of the season, but making it more rapidly when we the opportunity to do it. So right now we can put out about 6,500 gallons per minute, but we really think we should be getting up to eight, nine, maybe even 10,000 gallons per minute. So when we have that thaw like we had a, a week ago, we can recover much faster and not necessarily rely on the luck of Mother Nature bailing us out. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the, the guests also are, you know, continuously looking at are we operating you know, responsibly and are we operating in a, a really good way. Now, I don't think that ski industry is going to disappear in my lifetime. I think we're fortunate in many ways that we're higher elevation, we're further north, we get some lake effect snow. Sometimes even slightly warmer temperatures create more snow. But we don't want to bank on that, you know, even though there might be not a short-term crisis. But I want to make sure that the ski industry is around for my grandchildren's life and then their grandchildren's life. And that's why we have to start making all these initiatives. Um, I do support uh, H680A. I think the state needs a strong action plan that provides a good, clear roadmap. And as Mary said, you know, strategic plans, you make them, but you don't put them out there and they last forever, but they provide a roadmap. 
it provides some initiative. And clearly, you have to have goals, and then you have to have accountability, you have to hold people accountable to action. A good business does that, a bad business doesn't. You really have to have a roadmap, it changes, you have to adapt, but you have to have goals, you have to have accountability, and you have to hold people to that accountability. You know, I'm sure what's going to happen after you hear a lot of testimony, there are probably going to be tweaks to this bill. But I think, in my opinion, this is providing a very good framework. Uh, I've had a little concern what Mary said. Anytime you get big councils and big committees, you know, there's a risk to that. But nevertheless, this is a good framework. If you go forward, I would encourage you to actually seek out the, the voice of the ski industry. I'm not representing the ski industry today. Maybe Molly will in a future testimony. But I think we have a lot of input. We have a lot of skin in the game. And I think we're very interested in making sure that we're doing the right things. So we're a small state. You know, there's no silver bullet. You know, maybe when we have battery storage, that's when we can really go to 100% renewable energy. That may be the silver <coughs> bullet. It's not here yet. It's coming. But in the meantime, what can we do in the state? Well, I think there are a number of things we can do, and we're trying to do with Sugarbush, too. One is, I think, you can encourage nature-based solutions, such as protecting our forests from development of fragmentation, promoting reforestation. Maybe there's some interesting tax benefits that encourage people to reforest, to take their land and use it differently. Uh, promoting uh, and accelerating the restoration of degraded wetlands, encouraging the development of healthier agricultural soils to capture and store carbon. Fossil fuels are a big problem, but so is methane. Healthier soils, you know, actually can create some interesting nature-based solutions. As mentioned, I think also earlier, uh, public transportation. We've got to improve public transportation so that our current dependence on personal vehicles is reduced. That also helps on a busy ski weekend when you don't have millions oh of God. vehicles going up the snow road. <laughs> the road. It takes four yeah. hours. But, but in, all, in all seriousness, um, public transportation is key. That's the big issue in Vermont today. And also from the business, we need better public transportation to get employees. If I'm hiring people which I hope to and try to from Montpelier and Barry, you know, that's a long commute for them. They don't necessarily have a car. They sometimes can't afford a car. So public transportation also serves real business need. Uh, also, I think we can continue to install more electrical vehicle charging stations to promote electrical vehicle ownership. You know, frankly, I would like to do it. Right now, when I look at my commute sometimes, there's not enough stations along the way to make that practical. So I think the more we have, it takes away the impediment of really moving to electrical vehicles. I also think we continue to promote well-sited and appropriately scaled solar development and eliminating the cumulative net median cap. So I know there's some controversy to that, but I do think that this is something that we can move towards and we have, and I'd encourage more. Uh, fifth, encouraging energy efficiency and strategic electrification you know, while reducing um, our dependence on fossil fuels by expanding the ability of Efficiency Vermont to fund additional impactful projects. I'll give you an example. You know, if we put in wider pipes, greater volume, we can put more <coughs> water up the hill with the same amount of electricity. Should that be something that is incentivized as opposed to the addition of just going to low energy snowmaking? If I have the ability to buy an electrical groomer instead of relying on what is the classical diesel groomer, would that be useful? It's probably a 50% premium once we develop <coughs> the technology, so there is a motivation to really getting people to do that. So perhaps if you think creatively, energy efficiency for mod can fund additional projects which get us to our goal. Then I think importantly, and this is something that struck me from a actually a Nature Conservancy meeting I was at is I don't think there is enough discussion at the dinner table, at the home, about the climate crisis. And unless you discuss something, it's remote. Too many people believe there's climate change, but they don't really understand how it's impacting them, and they don't really feel they can do anything about it. So one of the things I think we can do as a state, and I think we can do as a business, is to educate more of our visitors about the climate crisis, the impact it's already having on our state, the impact it can have on the ski industry, and then what they can do about a person. Again, small little steps sometimes can make a difference symbolically, but also realistically. And an example of that, um, in the middle of President's Week on February 22nd, we're going to be doing a panel on climate change with Protect Our Winners. And the messaging there is not doom and gloom, you know, because that can turn people off. 
and it's not projecting a polar bear on a melting icicle, but it's educating people about the science, what is happening, why it's happening, what is the likely outcome going to be here, and then more importantly, what can and should we be doing. So that's a dialogue, I think, you know, in a small state, you know, it's maybe not the silver bullet, but I think those small states, you know, can make a difference. And again, I think in Vermont we can be a leader, and as I start off by saying, I do think that H six eighty eight is a good roadmap and a good start, and we do support that. Thank you. Um, I don't want to take us down a, a granular rabbit hole <laughs> here, but I, I'm really interested um, from a market perspective. Yeah. And if you don't have information on this, that's great. We can follow up at some time. Uh, you probably have a lot of customers <coughs> who come from out of state. Yes. Um, as you said, you've you put in, uh, EV infrastructure in yep. place. Yep. Um, I'm curious, you know. The market that you serve, how many people are um, driving Sorry. EVs to Vermont? And yeah, I, I how many tell are you, concerned it's about that? It, you know, it is increasing. So when I take a look at you know the electrical chargers on a weekend, they are mostly used. Hmm. I had a complaint yesterday from somebody who said somebody was hogging it. They'd already charged the car and they were off ski. You know, so he wanted to get in and actually get their electrical to charge. Yeah. So I think you know it's a chicken and the egg, but I do see more electrical vehicles, and I do see more demand for it, and I think we're going to see most of those 22 ports filled. Yeah, I'm really interested in that, from people yeah. driving from Boston or whatever. Yeah. That well, it's not just Boston, it's even yeah. Burlington. Yeah. And, you know, I know uh, two years ago, somebody who's a friend called up and he said, where can I get my electrical vehicle charged? We didn't have it yet at Sugarbush, yeah. but the West Hill Inn did, and his car just, you know, was able to get up and over the app gap, but he needed to get charged to get home. Yeah. So it's not just Boston, it's the local market, too. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had any information based, uh, like um, uh, reduced revenue or increased costs that you could directly attribute to climate? Uh, it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to do that, right? But I, I can tell you that if last weekend we didn't have that recovery, you know, we would have lost probably a couple million dollars of revenue. So that's pretty significant. Because yeah. in the ski business, what a lot of people don't realize, we're open 160 days a year. We make our business in about 40 days. The other days we kind of chug along because we have to, but we lose, you know, three days on Martin Luther King. That's three of the 40. Very hard to recover from that. So I'm really looking more at the potential threat here. Mm -hmm. I do know when we've had bad winters, you know, what that impact is. And you multiply that across 18 resorts, and it's big for the state. But it's also a multiplier because for every dollar spent in our valley, you know, on the mountain, there's probably another dollar spent in the valley either um, you know, lodging, um, filling up you know, the car, going to the grocery store, eating out. So it's a multiplier effect, which is, can be really significant. Thanks, Rick. Um, how are you? Good. I'm well. <laughs> um, so I, I'm interested in the last comment you made with regard to uh, the education piece on climate change. And it's funny that you said it because I was talking to Phil. Yep. Phil, earlier, yeah, well, I wasn't close. sure if he was here. So I, I, I ran into him in the cafeteria earlier, and um, and what is one thing that's frustrating? This is probably more of a statement, but I'd love this to be sort of incorporated into education about climate change. But what is frustrating for me, as a lifetime Vermonter being here, is hearing, uh, just knowing that we are, um, um, we have grown into such a consumer culture a throwaway, disposable culture, um, and yet <clears throat> yet it is, it is um, the blame for everything that is going on right now is put on this older culture that we've created this mess that, um, that we're in now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's frustrating because I, I think back to uh, how I was raised and, you know, mom had this big thing, you know, use it up, wear it out, make it do, do without. Boom, that was it. We had one car, we had six kids. <laughs> um, nobody was able to get a car. My parents didn't buy us cars. Um, we um, biked around, we walked around, we lived in the village, um, we didn't have big houses. Um, and I just, I just want that to be part of the education. People flying all over to go travel here and there and everywhere. Um, yeah, and that happens that, yeah. all the time. Yeah, and then they complain, they, I mean we, complain about the climate change and yet they're traveling to you know Seattle to go mm -hmm. to a 
climate change conference. <laughs> um, and, and, and a toaster breaks and we throw it away uh, uh, instead of going to an appliance store to fix it. It's, um, and, and again, televisions, phones, everything, it's just such a, a and I want that to be really uh, part of this answer because I'm, I'm yep. tired of that kind of um, hypocrisy. No, I think you're spot on, Heidi. And I don't think, I would never say we want to go back to the dark ages. No. Okay, that's not realistic. That's right. But, but can yeah. we be more sensible? Can we learn? Well, I'm part of the problem, right? I'm the baby boom generation, so I'm part of the problem. You know, I remember, you know, probably the biggest impact I had in college was the first May Day, you know, Earth Day. That made a, made a big deal. But I get very comfortable. So I think part of our education, yes, and that's those cumulative little steps. What can we all do a little bit better? You know, one thing we're doing with just water in, in our cafeterias yeah. is we're taking out the, the cups, right? Mm -hmm. Little step. We don't have plastic straws. Little step. But I think the more and more you educate people about the impact they can have, the better it is. And, and that is a dialogue. It's not, it's not a diatribe. It's not a blame. It's recognizing that the world we knew 40 years ago is changing. And now we've got to be ahead of that change and we've got to do our part. And I do think that the younger generation is teaching us stuff. You know, when you hear their voices, revolutions are never started by old people, right? <laughs> revolutions are always started by young people. And very often they're not heard for a period of time, but those voices resonate. And I would say we better understand it because I am increasingly convinced that young people are going to put their dollars where people are responsible. My old world of financing and investing, I'm still on the board of Eve Advance. We're making a big initiative into ESG investing. Why? Because we're a business. We want to continue to thrive, but we know that the customer wants that type of investment process now. And so that's, I think, my answer to you. Let's stop blaming each other. Let's learn, and let's see how we can change behavior without going back to the dark ages, which is not going to be the case. I, I, And I didn't mean that, but it's, no, it's but I, just it's a good point. exceptionally yeah. frustrating. But I will see, you know, sometimes, you know, when we put out a message, we have to also realize that we're going to take some flack. I put out a message um, what, a year or so ago encouraging people to support our continuation of the Paris Accord, or the Paris Climate Accord. And I'd say 98% sort of nice comments on social media, but then we got some really bitter, nasty, personal. Now, when I did some research, it wasn't our clients, it wasn't Vermonters, it was the trolls out there. And so you have to recognize sometimes you've got to be a little courageous to <coughs> take a stand. You know, you may get criticized, and you may, you know, have some some damage, but you just have to have the courage to take it and move forward if you think it's the right thing to do. Let's get the students on the buses. Half empty whenever they go by my house. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Public transportation. <laughs> yeah. It's actually often the parents that are driving. That's what I mean. So sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, smaller buses. Yeah. Any other questions for Wynn? Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Would you like a couple of cups of this? Or do you have We've got it on our website, but okay. you know, people Thank want you very much. Thank you. Standing on, uh, in on our view. Jen, did you have anything that you wanted to do? Yeah. Okay. We're going to keep going here, folks. So, Jen, thank you for joining us today. Um, our next guest is uh, is Jen Duggan, and um, again, similar to Wynn, uh, I've invited you here really to wear kind of a couple of hats, or um, you have a, a extensive experience in state government, um, experience in other states uh, in our region uh, working on this issue and uh, currently working for the Conservation Law Foundation in Vermont. Um, so appreciate you uh, coming in and um, offering your thoughts on H688. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the record, and sure. welcome. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'm Jen Duggan, and I'm the director of Conservation Law Foundation in Vermont. 
And prior to joining CLF, I was the general counsel for the Agency of Natural Resources for three years, both under the Shumlin administration and the Scott administration. And in that role, I managed the office of general counsel, um, which included management of 15 lawyers and provided legal services to the central office, um, but also the Department of Environmental Conservation, Fish and Wildlife, um, Forests, Parks, and Recreation. And in that role, I also provided legal advice to the Secretary and Department Commissioners on rulemaking, permitting, litigation, legislation, all variety of legal issues. And you would be surprised at the wide variety of issues that surface at ANR. Um, and prior to that role, I had a pretty significant regulatory practice. Um, uh, federal regulatory practice um, in Washington, D.C., representing community groups and other organizations in um, major rulemakings um, with the federal government. And I want to start off by saying we fully support this bill. We think this um, legislation is critical uh, to get the state back on track um, and to meet uh, the climate crisis. Um, and I've been following the testimony and thinking about what would be most helpful for the committee. I've been you know, following the testimony very closely for the past couple weeks and really listening to the questions that have surfaced either from this committee um, or through witnesses. And would like to talk through some of those questions um, and share my perspective. Um, in some cases, I have specific suggestions um, for consideration, but really to utilize you know my background as a general counsel my regulatory experience um, and sort of my um, experience uh, being engaged at a regional level um, to share with this committee and before I walk through specific sections um, of the bill I thought it would be helpful to share some big picture comments to, to provide some context you all have already heard a lot of testimony, and I don't want to repeat a lot of things um, that have already been said, but I think that there are some key points to just sort of highlight and, and emphasize before I talk through specific sections. Um, you know, you've heard testimony on the urgent need to take action. We're off track, um, and that's important not only to do our part to address the global climate crisis, but we have communities that are really suffering right now um, that need action. And you've also heard that it is going to be critical that we um, move forward with this transition, um, ensuring that it is done in an equitable way and that we are not leaving communities behind. And you've also heard that action on climate brings significant economic, public health, and environmental benefits. Um, it grows the economy, creates jobs, saves money on healthcare costs, improves public health and the quality of our natural and working lands and our waterways. And on the flip side, you've heard from the treasurer um, this afternoon that a failure to act brings significant cost and risks uh, to the state. Um, and the other important point I think that has surfaced in the past two weeks through the testimony here is that the, this framework works. Um, Massachusetts has set targets um, under their Global Warming Solutions Act, and they've actually met them while growing their economy, while creating opportunities um, for their citizens, and capitalizing on all of the co-benefits that come along with cutting carbon, addressing resilience. Um, and our neighbors have taken notice. You know, They are passing similar laws. And so I think it's important to note that Vermont is not blazing a new trail. We have a good model. Um, we have lots of experience to draw from. Um, and so, you know, this is not something that we're getting way out ahead of the curve um, on. So why um, does this framework work? You know, the type of challenge that we're facing, you know, to deal with mitigation and resilience and adaptation, it is cross agency, it is cross sector, it requires action on the part of state government, the private sector, individuals, and it requires a lot of different kinds of strategies. <coughs> and there's a lot of work that is being done that is diffuse through state government that you know private companies are starting to do. 
Um, but there's really not one person, one agency that is responsible for leading that work and making sure that what we're doing is really focused and strategic and coordinated. And one of the things that I have found most troubling in the testimony this past, um, these past two weeks is that we don't even have a list, a comprehensive list of all the actions that we're taking, um, what that work is actually accomplishing, um, and how and whether or not it's cost effective. And so we don't even have sort of the basic um, foundation in terms of what are we doing um, at this point. And this type of action really, it requires, uh, you know, addressing the climate crisis requires state action and leadership. Um, you know, I, I, I understand some of the concerns about um, not wanting to um, create bureaucracy and, you know, Ken is government up to the challenge, but we really can't meet this challenge without state action and leadership. And so the question becomes, you know, how do you do that in the most effective way? Um, you know, we, market-based solutions, private sector leadership, all of the creative innovation um, and thinking um, and personal action, these are all critically important. But if you want to maximize and direct those types of actions, you have to have binding requirements and you have to have the right regulatory framework in place. I think, you know, we talked uh, earlier, Mary Powell mentioned, the incredible progress that the electric sector has made and, and that's sort of an example of where we are succeeding. And that is one of the most heavily regulated industries. And I think it really helps underscore that if you put the right regulatory framework in place, then you create the space and the tension um, to do all of the things and to direct all of these great actions that are happening um, in a coordinated and strategic way. Um, while making sure that that work is happening in a way that is equitable. You know, we know that climate change and this transition is going to disproportionately impact rural and vulnerable communities. And you need process and state government to be ensuring that that transition is happening in an equitable way. And so, you know, the, the question then is really, how do you make this work, um, streamline this action, act quickly, remove unnecessary bureaucracy, um, and, and the GWSA does this with very aggressive timelines to make sure that we get started now and ensure that we're on track to meet net zero by 2050, no matter who is governor and who is in the legislature. You know, one of the things um, that, and, this transcends, transcends politics, it transcends all of us, and I'm really constantly reminded of that, you know, watching the young people that have been showing up um, in your committee room, thinking about the communities that have been, that are already being impacted um, and are being left behind, um, and the questions that my six and eight year olds ask me about the climate crisis. It's a constant reminder that this transcends all of us, and we need to put in place a framework that is going to outlast, you know, the current administration five years from now. You know, this is, we have to be in it for the long haul. And one of the other, I think, points and questions that have, that came up today was, you know, does this limit the ability of the private sector or the legislature or other agencies to do more? You know, does that count towards the reduction goals? And, and the answer is yes. You know, the bill doesn't limit that. Um, we can always do more. Um, you know, the, we can act faster than this framework. This just makes sure, you know, this is the floor. This makes sure that no matter what, we get to net zero by 2050 and we are not leaving communities behind. So that's sort of some overarching thoughts um, that had really surfaced for me um, in listening to the testimony. And I wanted to touch on some specific comments about the, the Climate Council, um, the Climate Action Plan, and the Cause of Action section. And, and starting with the Climate Council, 
there have been questions about whether or not there should be term limits. Um, you know, how can we ensure that folks have the space um, to do the work without fear of political interference? And I think that the answer is yes. You know, we can do more to ensure that and to protect that that council. And the main statute provides a really good model. And so I would just suggest looking at that model that does set term limits um, for council members. And it also ensures that removal is, only happens if there's incompetence or misconduct um, or a failure to perform duties. And so the main model is, is, is certainly a good example of how, how to do that. Um, one other small um, imp but important distinction is that, you know, as drafted, the bill, um, the bill sets forth membership um, that basically talks about um, folks that represent sectors. Um, and I think it needs to be clear that we're looking for people with expertise in certain sectors, not just representation. Um, this council will need to be a working council. We want people that you know have the expertise um, to bring to the table, and so I think that's a small but really important distinction. You know, the other question that has arisen is who should be the chair, um, and whether or not that's the secretary of administration or should the chair be A and R. And there are you know pros and cons to both of these approaches, but I think on balance, A and R is really the best qualified to lead that work and to um, to be the chair of that climate council you know I think that we, we heard from the deputy secretary earlier this week that ANR is already playing that de facto climate lead um, even if that may be in a more limited way they're already doing that work and in addition to having authority to regulate um, emissions ANR also um, has you know significant programs associated with resilience and natural and working lands. And so there is a wide breadth of experience in that agency. Um, there's a lot of technical expertise in that agency. Um, and so I think, you know, on balance, that is really going to be the most effective to get this work done. And the Secretary of Administration um, is going to be playing the mediator role regardless. You know, they, it's not um, that is always available to work through those um, if there are conflicts that arise. And that happens, you know, that's, we heard from the Attorney General, that's not uncommon, you know, that happens frequently. With regard to the Climate Action Plan. Do you want, would you prefer to go through and then? You can please interrupt me with questions. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear myself talk for 30 minutes. So just on this um, specific piece, this is an area of interest for me. Yeah. And and I'd like to understand, make sure I'm clear on, on your recommendation, and it's based yeah. on um, technical knowledge. I think that there's not one agency that covers all of the climate issues, right? That's right. ANR has a pretty significant um, body of authority, both in terms of the mitigation <coughs> component, but also in terms of natural systems and resilience and river corridors and working lands through forestry. Um, and there is a wide, you know, there is a significant breadth of technical expertise inside that agency. Um, and so I think that, you know, out of all the agencies, you know, they, um, it makes sense to have them lead that work. And, and why would you argue against the agency and administration leading that? Because the agency of administration doesn't have the sort of the program or the technical expertise and is not, um, doesn't have the experience doing that type of detailed work. And I, I think that because we are moving fast, mm -hmm. um, because these are very aggressive timelines, you want that council, you want folks that have expertise, and you want the work close, you know, to the technical people that have the knowledge doing that work. And the Secretary of Administration will always be, um, th that that will always play a mediator role, regardless of whether or not they are the chair of this particular committee. Were you, I, I don't recall if you were in here this morning for Sue Minter's testimony. Were you in here for that? I was not, but I did review her testimony. Okay. Um, and so one of the other questions that I've been asking um, uh, different agencies and departments, which I will note you are not, um, is who's 
responsible. That's me kicking that darn plug. Uh, there's no foot room in here either. Uh, who is responsible in state government for protecting Vermonters from the effects of climate change? I think that is diffuse. I mean, I think that there are part of, there's not one um, agency that is charged with that. You know, ANR has the responsibility to protect drinking water. You know, that is impacted by climate change. Um, and for example, so that would be one area where they may play a role. I think it is diffuse. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would agree with you, yeah. which uh, still you know, has me in conflict about yeah. uh, agency of administration versus um, agency right. of natural resources. So, okay, thank you. Scott, Mark, and um, so following up, is there a role for agency of administration that should be, that could be, should be specified? In, in, in the in the process in the on the, on the climate council for a second. Yeah. You know, it would not be our recommendation for them to be formal. You know, identified in the bill or to have a formal role. Um, but you certainly could do that. Um, okay. <laughs> and I and I do think to your point, there you know there are there's not necessarily a wrong or a right answer um, in terms of. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think that, you know, it will be up to this committee to think through what the pros and cons are. Thank you. But I think our recommendation for the reasons that I've talked about is that sure. ANR would be the chair. And I would just like to suggest that um, through uh, my looking at uh, the Act 250 process and talking to a number of people who've gone through it, regarding, you know, proposed changes and all that sort of stuff. I would say the atmosphere that I heard of out there is a total lack of respect and, um, you know, for, for the agency of natural resources. I mean, the, the, the individuals that I talked to that, that support, you know, the, the guidelines of Act 250 or whatever, they had no problem with that. But when they got down to dealing with Act 250, there was indications of disrespect outright you know, um, yeah, it was just, it was terrible. So I think we've got uh, a ways to go if we are gonna have that agency be the, the lead on this. Um, and I don't know if you've heard that as well, but that's what I'm hearing from so many people. I, I haven't, I mean, I have a different perspective. Um, and I think we heard uh, from the treasurer earlier today that, you know, she, the work with the, with ANR was um, you know, that folks were professional and were, did a great job and it was superb working with them. Um, and I'm not sure exactly. You're talking about working with the public? Yes. Yeah. What, what you're commenting on, I, I have a different perspective. Um, well, we won't go into it, but I can give you a list this long. Yeah. The individuals that have, you know, I, I've got pages of it, so. Yeah, I can't, I can't really comment on that. And, and was the interaction with ANR or with the Anna. Natural Resources Board? Yeah. Um, following on this theme, <laughs> um, you listed some of the areas where ANR has authority or the and uh, Act 250. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are too. Should there be an, a climate czar who can reach into the different agencies but doesn't um, Distract, doesn't doesn't uh, distract a, se a secretary from the very significant workload that already exists. Right, and and I think that there are lots of different models that you might use, uh, but I think that if the goal is maximizing the ex you know not building out you know being mindful of not building out more bureaucracy and maximizing the existing expertise in state government mm -hmm. um, I think that you know would counsel in favor of looking at where do we have the expertise who is already doing that work um, um, and coordinating um, and building on that rather than creating you know standing up a whole other office or structure which I think would slow you know could slow the work down and we've heard you know I, um, 
we need to move quickly. And the, the deadlines in, you know, in the statute are aggressive um, for a reason. Thanks. Please continue. With respect to the Climate Action Plan, I think one of the things that uh, we heard was that we need to take an inventory um, of the current work that's being done, and I absolutely. Um, but that is not the work, that shouldn't be the work of the Climate Council. That work can be done right now, and that should be given to the Climate Council um, when they show up for their first day of work so that they can have a good understanding of the landscape and can begin to build on that work and so there is um, you know one recommendation would be to include um, you know a directive in the bill that would require ANR to put together that inventory by a date certain so that it is um, ready um, so that work can begin on day one for the Climate Council with respect to resilience in the climate action plan um, one of the the concerns that I heard surfaced is that the the specific requirements um, in the plan. Um, Sorry, can I go back? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, with regard to the inventory, mm -hmm. so I'm going to think I'm I'm going to go back to my original yeah. discussion, and, and you're saying we should have A and R put that together. We took testimony in here from the Department of Health. Um, they have a very significant um, uh, socioeconomic vulnerability index, they which do. is something. So, you know, does A and R? I mean, again, is that their view of state government, or is that uh, the agency of administration's view of state government? Like, how how does that information? Is that really their role to go through all of the? agencies and departments to inventory what is happening right now? I think that there, there is, um, again, I think that they um, have the capacity and the ability to do that. Um, and I think that you want one of the agencies that is, that is doing a significant portion of the climate resilience work to have ownership um, over that. Um, that already has expertise in working with other agencies. Um, you know, ANR touches a lot of this state. And so there is a lot of expertise inside that agency and working with Agency of Transportation and Department of Health, they coordinate with those agencies all of the time. And so this is not a new model. Um, and so I would just, you know, that, that is something that is done on a daily basis. So in terms of um, the, the concern about the directive to include strategies to, to build resilience, uh, you know, that can mean a lot of different things. I think that there are, um, you know, two ways that that could be um, addressed, um, you know, for the, the committee to consider. And, and one um, would be to spell out that these measures um, must increase the resilience of communities, infrastructure, and the economies. Um, and so there is a way, there is sort of a, a, a metric, even though it is very high level, that would be required um, for the plan and direct um, the council to develop metrics for that. Um, the other option would be to, um, to include specific metrics in the legislation so that there's clarity about what resilience what we are talking about when we mean resilience. And I think there are lots of models um, for that. So I think those would be the, you know, sort of the two options. And I do think it's important that, you know, that we get that part, that that part is correct um, and that we provide sufficient guidance there. Um, with respect to the rulemaking section, one of the questions I touched on this briefly that, that has come up um, is whether or not the bill prohibits um, other agencies from rulemaking. Um, and you know, the answer to that question is no. Um, other agencies can and they you know, will move forward with appropriate rulemaking in addition to ANR. 
Um, so there's no, you know, concern about whether or not this prohibits, um, you know, an agency from moving forward. And as I mentioned, you know, agencies have to navigate overlapping and complementary authority um, on a fairly regular basis. Um, and there are lots of ways to manage that through the governor's office, through the ICAR process and rulemaking. Um, so that's not uncommon. Um, and that's, you know, we, that will continue. Um, what you could do in this bill, though, is to be, is to include a provision that makes it clear that this bill doesn't limit existing authority of other agencies, that um, does not prohibit rulemaking. And Maine did something similar in the bill with the Agency of Transportation. They just made an express statement that, you know, the agency um, may move forward with rulemaking to address climate change. And so if, if that was a concern, you would be able to include something specific to make that clear that it would not limit existing authority. I think we're pretty explicit about that here. But we can take a look at that. The very last, uh, uh, the very last three line or three or four lines in the rulemaking section it says very specifically, nothing in this section shall be construed to limit the existing authority of state agency or department to regulate. That's that's great. I think it is a question that keeps coming up. Yeah. Um, Um, the other um, component of the rulemaking um, section is whether or not you know there's going to be sufficient public process. I think we've heard from Massachusetts and Maine about the importance of having this be a public and inclusive process, and um, you know I just wanted to note that. In addition to the Administrative Procedure Act, public notice and comment provisions, this bill does require the state to hold additional hearings and to hold those hearings in impacted communities. And the other thing to note in terms of facilitating public process is this requirement to create a detailed record um, that supports the agency's rules. And that may not seem like a public process issue, but it really is because it puts the burden on the agency to say why they believe this rule is consistent with the statute rather than on the citizen to try and figure out is this going to meet the target or not and so I, I, I think those are you know really important public process components in the bill that we think are important is that some uh, I'm not at all familiar with the rulemaking process is, is that something that is new and different or is that implied just as part of uh, you know kind of how we do rulemaking in Vermont that you know if, if certainly outside of ANR, that when you come forward with a rule, you have to um, lay out the, the reasoning and, and the tale behind why this rule is going to accomplish what the legislature had, had hoped it to? Or is that something that the, 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 the public has to come forward and try and pull out of the Yeah. Yep. So the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act does require a record, but it is not clear on what that record looks like, and it varies significantly from agency to agency. You know, in some page, in some cases, it's a it's a couple of pages. Um, it varies because of cultural reasons, or it varies because different agencies have different requirements in rulemaking. It varies because of institutional and cultural reasons. There, because the statute and the rules don't provide very specific guidance on that, it can look different. Um, and I, you know, especially with this. Um, type of rulemaking, you and the consequences if we don't get it right on the front end. Um, it's important to include the requirement to make it clear that they have to show their homework. Yeah. So, so, in just a little background, um, uh, again, uh, I'm not at all an expert on rulemaking, but as we were discussing this with legal counsel in recent months as we were going through this. This was something very specific um, because of, you know, potentially it leads into the cause of action section in the bill. But a record is important here to understand specifically what rulemaking was done and what the pathway was that was created there. Frankly, for the defensibility, um, if there is litigation that an ANR or another agency can say, here is precisely why we did what we did. Agree. It's important um, on the front end um, 
for a judicial review of the rules when they're first promulgated, and it's also important on the back end if the state fails to meet the targets under the emissions inventory um, and the cause of action is triggered um, for a court to evaluate whether or not the rules um, were strong enough and met the charge of the statute. So it's important for, for that reason, but also on the front end as well. Does uh, ANR have or are they contemplating anything like EPUC? An outward facing portal for uh, information on rule making and permitting and processes? And there is an environmental uh, notice bulletin that has some information, but I am not the right person to ask in terms of the extent of that or whether or not there are plans for a future expansion of that. My recollection, uh, uh, LCAR does require a statement as to uh, how the rulemaking supports legislative intent. Right. So I, I from what you were saying, I got the impression that you didn't think there was, but. No, there absolutely is that requirement, but it can be a three-page memo. And if you're <coughs> talking about rules that are gonna reduce carbon, that can be very complex, that may have technical and scientific components to it. It would need to be more detailed than that to actually demonstrate that the rules were gonna meet the statute. And so right now, there's not a lot of guidance around what that, you know, that basis looks like. And so it could be a very short memo. Um, and it really wouldn't give the legislature or citizens enough information to be able to evaluate whether or not those rules were going to achieve, were consistent with the statute. With respect to the cause of action section, there have been a lot of questions around that section generally. And so, you know, I wanted to kind of share my perspective on what this section does um, and then take questions on this. I, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that this is a backstop. This is not applicable. The cause of action is not triggered, you know, if the state is in compliance. And so it, that is sort of a prerequisite. And the framework is fairly, it's fairly simple. Um, if there are no rules, then a court can order the agency to do the rules. And what that looks like um, is an order that says, you know, agency, you have an obligation to do these rules and you haven't done that and here's a schedule. You need to get these rules done on a timeline. If the rules are, you know, are promulgated and they're not sufficient, right away you know citizens already have the ability under the administrative procedure act to go to a court and say hey this isn't valid this isn't consistent with the statute and there's also an opportunity for lcar you know to object as it's going through the rulemaking process if it's not consistent with the statute the you know sort of the third area is where we've missed the target and um this cause of action section where we've missed the target and the rules are why we've missed the target, then a court can order the agency to do the rules that they were required to do in the first place. And I think it's important, you know, that the statute expressly recognizes that we're expecting a complex mix of strategies to achieve these targets. And, you know, ANR um, is not on the hook where the legislature doesn't act, where there's not appropriation, you know, they are held accountable for what is within their sphere of control. And I think um, uh, there is absolute, you know, one of the recommendations that was talked about yesterday um, was to include a very specific provision to make it clear that judges, you know, are not allowed to engage in rulemaking or policy making. And that really the remedy is limited to um, a remand back to the agency for them to do what they're required to do in the first place. So what what if they don't do it? Well, then they're in contempt of court. Okay, yeah. and then what? Then a judge can move forward um, with 
you know, with the contempt of court order. I've never seen I've never seen that happen with an agency. Um, I think generally, the idea um, and the 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 um, uh, the seriousness of, I would a, hope of an it order. Happen. I'm just wondering what happens. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Do they go to jail? Or I have never seen that happen before. The whole agency. Oh well, no! <laughs> Pile them up. Round them up. <laughs> and I would hope that the seriousness of a court order would uh, would ensure that action would. But the judge still could that. make the policy. Well, I think that so under the current construct, that's that. I think the AGs and I agree um, with the AG. Uh, their um, uh, their thoughts yesterday. That would be grounds for appeal. You know, judges are not allowed to engage in that arena. Um, but in order to be very express and clear, you could include a provision that would just make that very clear um, in, in the remedy section. And so that would be a recommendation if that's a concern. Um, you know, the other important thing to, to note about the cause of action section is that clarity is important. I, you know, I think that anyone um, can file a lawsuit, um, but where you have a clear defined pathway that provides certainty for the agency, you know, that can limit litigation, um, you know, with respect to the procedural pathway, what the remedy is. Um, and so having a clear cause of action section can actually limit the time that people spend in court. The other thing to note is that this is a really narrow cause of action section. Um, and I just wanted to walk through, because I don't think anyone has done that, um, yet just how where all the limitations are um, the bill is really drafted um, you know to, to limit uh, the cause of action um, to very specific circumstances and so the first thing to note is that the statute of limitations here is one year so if, if there is a, a violation or there's a, a claim that um, the agency is not in compliance. Um, folks cannot sit on their hands and file a lawsuit five years later. Sorry, um, they are required to act within one year. There's notice that's required before a suit can be filed, um, and so this gives the agency the opportunity to uh, to take action to comply with the statute or to engage with um, plaintiffs before litigation is even brought to try and, and, and negotiate and resolve any questions. Um, and the remedy is limited to basically do what the statute tells you you have to do. Um, and we talked about how you know that can be made even more clear in terms of making sure that um, a judge does not overstep their authority. And then, you know, the other thing to note is that if ANR is taking prompt and effective action, then a court um, will fat, has to take that into account when they create the schedule. So if the agency says, judge, you know, we have a plan to get this done in a year and we've already taken these three steps, you know, the, the court is going to take that into account when creating that schedule for them to act. So that, I want to stop there and pause in case folks have questions um, about that section. So you've outlined these for us. Are, are these are there recommendations that go with this, or is that are you just flat <coughs> listing these for our? I think the verification? the one recommendation is to um, is to ensure that it's clear that a judge cannot make rules, make policy. But I I wanted to flag um, the ways that this cause of action section is limited, so that folks had an understanding of that. Um, the language around that is that if the court finds that the rules are a substantial cause of failure, the court shall enter an order directing the secretary to adopt or update rules that achieve the greenhouse gas emission reductions. And that's not clear enough. Well, what we had talked about was um, after, and this was in the AG's testimony yesterday, right, specifying the secretary to adopt or update rules in accordance with this act. Yes, I actually wrote that in here as yeah. well. But it's, act, but it's directing, it's telling the judge, rather, it, it's specifying that the remedy is 
uh, ordering the secretary to adopt the rules. And the concern that came up was, what if the judge um, included in that order, you know, A and R, you shall adopt rules that do X. And, you know, okay. a judge, I think that's grounds for appeal if a judge sort Does of that, dictates yeah, that yeah. in a very specific way, but you could make that clear. But in your, in your experience, that's, that yeah. could, that's a little wiggle from there. I think that it would be grounds for appeal, but I think if you wanted to make that clear, yeah. um, you could do that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. You know, and the last, um, you know, question that comes up is an important one, and, and that has been raised in a lot of different, um, you know, by different folks in different ways, but, you know, what are the costs to implement the work that we need to do? And, and that's an important question that can't be fully answered, but it will be answered through legislative and the rulemaking process. You know, once there are specific proposals there's an opportunity to engage and grapple with those questions. There's a directive, um, you know, to uh, prioritize strategies that are cost effective. And there's a process in place for having those discussions, whether it's legislative or it's rulemaking. And I think the other important question um, is, you know, what are the costs of not taking action? And we also can't fully, you know, answer that question also. Um, but some of the benchmarks, you know, that you've heard is, you know, from the treasurer today in terms of the material financial risk to the state of not taking action. Um, the Department of Health, you know, the figure of $1.1 billion in avoided health care costs and, and 2,000 lives by 2050, if we just meet our transportation goals alone. Um, you know, the Energy Action Network has done an analysis on how much we spend on, you know, heating fuel. and. You know, in, in, in 2018 alone, that amount was $240 million more than if we were 100% renewable energy. And that's dollars that would stay in Vermont families' pockets and our local economy. TNC has provided some information. You know, one wetland restoration, <coughs> $1.8 million in avoided damages. And there are mental and public health benefits associated with doing the work we need uh, to make communities more resilient, to make sure they have safe drinking water, to make sure that they have a good wastewater treatment system. There are missed opportunities if we don't take action in terms of new jobs and new financial pathways to support farms and forests. And so, you know, we, if you look at the cost question, in a macro scale, it's clear that we can't afford not to act. And the Global Warming Solutions Act puts in place binding requirements to make sure that we have the framework in place to facilitate that action. In the, uh, in the rulemaking process, I, I believe this is the case, but when, when you put forth a proposed rule, you need to include a financial impact. Uh, and in this case, I, I would think it would include both the, uh, the, the positive financial impact of, of kind of avoided costs, but it would, it, you would also, the agency would also say at the same time, and uh, that's going to take um, three new positions in order to enforce, or, you know, let, uh, just as an example, so that they would be putting that into their rulemaking proposal as well, and then it would obviously need to, uh, budgeting for that would then be a, a something that would have to ultimately go through through the legislature. In other words, the agency may say we're going to need three, three positions. Uh, the administration may agree and put that into the proposed budget, but it still comes, comes back here. I'm just sort of thinking through. That's, yeah. that's correct. And so when there is a specific regulatory pathway proposed and it goes through the rulemaking process, that cost conversation is required to happen. Um, yeah. So I guess to, to go further, uh, what the government said, so, so let's say the legislature doesn't authorize three new positions and we still have these benchmarks that we have to meet, what, what then? How do, how do we achieve that? How do, 
how does the agency of natural resources move forward well i think that you know that the statute in terms of enforcement and the cause of action section then it's you know the agency is not on the hook you know there's only a cause of action if we if we haven't met the targets and the rules are why we haven't met the targets you know if the agency is able to say we needed legislative action to do this um, or there needed to be an appropriation um, then that a judge is, is not going to be able to find that the rules were a substantial cause of why they didn't achieve the emissions inventory it's not perfect I mean I think there are I think what you're pointing out is that there are some gaps um, here um, you know there is no if the, le the legislature um, does not act on a recommendation um, there's no cause of action for that um, there there are some gaps and I'll editorialize on that I think that is a that is absolutely a flaw here um, and uh, personally I am committed uh, you know if I'm reelected that you know, to see the legislature move ahead <coughs> with um, legislative initiatives that are proposed that we think are good ones, collectively as a body, um, including spending um, priorities that are highlighted. Maybe as a body we won't go forward with those. Maybe they'll be rejected. But very specifically, the cause of action section says here, um, and it's, it's the, it's the you know, it's part B of that section, that, um, that the court finds that the rules adopted by the secretary pursuant to 593 of this chapter are substantial cause of failure. Um, I think that is intentional language. Which I think, you know, there may be objections to, but it, it's, uh, yeah. Well, it, that would be my objection, because again, if we feel as a body that we don't have that money, mm -hmm. regardless of what you know we yep. think the effects might be if we don't act. Yep. I, you know, that, that to me is where our responsibility lies. And who knows I, what it might be around? It might be around a big recession. It might be yep. around who knows? But I mean, I 100% agree. Okay. Um, but I, I, I think that um, you know, as we're talking through the cause of action section, um, what can we hold? a regulatory agency accountable for, in this case, a and um, Yeah, you know, I've already expressed what my experience is in the courtroom. So far, not a lot. But, you know, can a judge hold, in this case, a and responsible for substantial failure? You know, if they have failed within their capacity to um, pass rules, I would say yes. If um, there's failure because of things that you know maybe the legislature has done, and ANR would make that case successfully, then I think that the judge would just would rule in favor and in, in favor of them. But again, our experts uh, are are sitting around the room here, not at the side of the table. No, and I I agree with that. I think that the agency has a strong case to make if they're if if the the action. Um, is outside of their control if it's a legislative if it's legislation if it's appropriation um, then it will be very hard for someone to um, be able to show that the rules are why um, we didn't meet the targets because NR will be able to say these other three things needed to happen and yeah. those were, that was the, the reason why and I will say at the other end of that spectrum uh, again to editorialize my interest and intention here is seeing that uh, ANR and other agencies have broad authority, maybe even broader authority than they have now, to regulate uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, uh, with the effect of reducing it. Um, but again, there are clearly limits on that, um, depending on appropriation, depending on their internal resources to enforce and make rule. Are we cutting you off? 
No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I, I've gotten through what I wanted to say. If you okay. all have other questions, I'm happy to, yeah. to stay and answer them. But. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Appreciate it. Um, we're running about 25 minutes behind. If you don't mind, we take just four minutes, Luke, because i got to stand up and maybe people can stretch their legs. And Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, questions, issues, and you can make the list or whatever, however you want to see from I would actually like you to make the list because ultimately you're going to be charged with kind of helping us make the changes to the bill yeah. as we make them. So. Um, I'm willing to help out to some extent. Um, I find it, so this is a, a strategy running the committee issue. So I've been in some committees where you have about 100 people and they all put in language and it's not very productive yeah. because you haven't made the underlying policy decisions. Sometimes I think it's better if the committee all right, what list of what are the issues or questions you have, yep. work through the, those, make those decisions. Once you make the decision, I'm sure we can write language to get you to your end point. And so it's sort of a list, definitely, discussion, decision, right. then craft the language to achieve that result. So I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, so for me, what might be most helpful here, and I don't know if this is where we're going, but mm -hmm. is to just kind of go through okay. and put flags. So, like, as places that the committee wants to come back to. Like, this is an area that we know we're going to need to. Like, there may be places that there's no work that the committee yep. is interested in doing, and not necessarily try and solve the problem today, but start to lay out a map. Is that where? Yeah. Again, my, my analogy was an inventory of what those issues are. You know, I think what you're getting at are there parts of the bill that, you know, we may not pay a whole lot of attention to yeah. or that we kind of want to uh, move beyond. Yes. Um, but so specific examples might be like, should there even be a commission? Yeah. If there is a commission, should it be 21 or 10? Yeah. Should yeah. It, you know, on and on and on. Certainly a, yeah. a high level decision is, do we have a council here? Um, <laughs> if we get beyond that question, uh, and we had testimony today saying no council. And, and frankly, that's where we were six months ago uh, in this bill. But it, you know, if and when we get beyond that question, I think there's absolutely conversation about who's in the room uh, working on these issues. And uh, we certainly heard some input on that in recent days. So was the decision to sort of go section by section but say, hey, this is something we want to discuss further or we may have issues about? And then let, it's, let, it's me, non let me suggest we start from the beginning and, right. and turn pages. And okay. I think some of those pages are going to be quick, pretty yep. quick pages. Do okay. you want to um, lead that or you want me to lead that or what's best for you? Uh, well, I will kick it off saying okay. I have a couple of things that I have flagged in the findings section okay. that um, I'm not recommending changes, but mm -hmm. are things that have stood out to me, um, both feedback that I've heard and um, you know some things that other members have mentioned. Uh, and I'll mention two off the top, top of my head. Uh, on page five, uh, line six, uh, I heard uh, Representative Higley, you know, question some of the wording here. And um, I don't know enough about this issue. You know, I don't want to put too much weight on the findings and how much time we spend on this. But, um, you know, the conservation and restoration of Vermont Forest Club. And uh, Mark, you had, you know, raised the question about and restoration. And what did that say? It's on page five. Page five, line six. On page five, your So I circled that in my copy. It's um, in finding uh, number on, seven. On, lay, on uh, line nine. Keep up. Keep up. Well, I, on line I don't nine, have the same page as you do. Okay. On line nine, um, uh, uh, the treasurer had called out, you know, a question, and I think her concern about specifying a private company here, um, as you know, and as to whether or not we want to refer to, you know, the credit rating agency industry generally. So that was another thing that I flagged in the findings as um, we might be a little less um, specific to a, a, a private entity there. But those are two things in the findings that I had flagged that I've heard from people on. Um, I we should consider a, a finding talking about the upper economic opportunity. Okay. Because the, these are all pretty much negative. If we don't, then that's, mm -hmm. but, uh, we've heard several people testify to the, the opportunities created. Yep. I have nothing on opportunity. 
start off, there's uh, one question that I've heard um, come up on a couple of occasions, which is uh, the definition of greenhouse gas. Um, and Luke, I thought I recall you saying that uh, that is defined in some parts of statute or in some titles, but not it, others. It is, and when I came back, I said uh, probably good to have that across reference inserted because we wave structure now it's in a different chapter. Yeah. So valid point, yes. And on that, oh. um, was it? Somebody said that that's defined in uh, the Massachusetts statute. Well, we have a state definition that's pretty good, so I just cross reference that or repeat it here. Okay. So do I think you, it should be a defined term. Right. But do you know what that is offhand, or, or I know the definition off the top of my head. No, well, cannot <laughs> <laughs> it back. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, Okay. Next time yeah, but I, I think we should use an existing state definition, yeah. otherwise we'd be right. rewriting the state yeah. definition. Yeah. So would you, would you we should do that state definition or would you repeat it in here? I think either is fine. Let's, let's, we'll figure that out if we have a separate definition section. If at some point in the but future it changes, there. you would only want to change it from one place to another. Unless one of the stakeholders says the current definition, which I think we're all aware of, is not a good one, yeah, I would just cross-reference or repeat that. Okay. Mm -hmm. but there was another um, uh, bit of input we had from ANR with regard to um, the ability uh, for how uh, the greenhouse, the current greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Uh, accounting works whether we would be able to include um, uh, some benefits that we get from regional uh, partnerships within that accounting. So changing how the accounting is currently done. That is a question that came up. Okay. Um, Where you at? Well, that would have to be new. I think. Yeah, that would have because it's not. It's with the four seventy or excuse me, five seventy seven. It's, it's not. Yeah, it's not captioned five seventy eight. It is in 582. So, this is the So, say that again. What are you trying to capture there? Um, we this actually have, a we have the deputy secretary in the room. So. so, in the provision for how we calculate, for the record, Peter Walk, deputy secretary of the agency, not there. So in the way we currently calculate greenhouse gases, there is there is uh, an understanding for how we calculate electric power production that is based on the consumption based on what we're buying, rather than our production in state because we are buying on, a, on a, a grid and we are part of a regional program where we're getting emission reductions around the region. So we want to make sure that we're capturing that we are getting those regional emission reductions. Were we to have a nationwide cap and trade or something else for different programs and we were participating in getting credit for those reductions as, as a part of the overall reductions across the country, we would want to capture that again on sort of a demand basis or, or, or counting for that participation because that's the whole reason to participate in those sorts of things so that it's easier for everybody to get the most cost effective reductions as a whole rather than those reductions having to occur in Vermont because that becomes much more complicated to measure and, and, and lessens the appropriateness of participating in those sorts of cost effective regional and national programs. 
Okay, so would that become C? No, or part it's, of C. No, or it wouldn't. It, you know, if if we made changes here, it would be in Section 582 of uh, of uh, 10 BSA 582 is where that definition is. It's not part of this bill right now. Oh, I see. If so that would be in it, Section right. 3. Right. It would be section three. It would be a different section. A different section of the bill. Section four. <clears throat> yeah, it'd be section three or section, section three A or something. Like that. So we haven't dug into that at all. But if you have any specific suggestions on that, and we decide to dig into it, that would be that would be helpful. Uh, we will do our best to quickly come up with language. Okay. talked about uh, resiliency and perhaps defining resiliency and um, not including in here not any kind of matrix for determining how we increase resiliency but uh, the first place that I actually see it mentioned is at the top of page 9 line 1 and, uh, specifically the word resiliency. the word resiliency yeah. and I'm wondering if it wants to go back in, uh, well, in Section 3 of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction about Requirements, that's what we're measuring, the, the goals. But I, mean, I wonder if we should men introduce resiliency in this section, in the goals section. So uh, just to be clear, section, you're talking about Section 3? Yes. So what that is, is it is current mm -hmm. law. I'm, I'm looking at mandatory reductions. Yeah, I'm looking at 3C, where we're talking about uh, okay. like, um, somewhere in lines 17, 18, 19, we start talking about uh, ma construction maintenance of buildings, services, line 20, services and infrastructure. Um, I don't know. I wish I had a more specific No, I think that's, I that's clear on the idea. I, it, so uh, I think this part of statute refers to state infrastructure as opposed to something more broadly. Uh -huh. So that might be more confining than you want it to be. That would be, yeah. yes. So I'm, I'm just wondering if this is this, maybe not 3C, but maybe 3D, a new D about uh, in goals. Can I ask a question here? Yeah. So. Uh, oh, wait, of me? No. Yes. Um, <laughs> so are you. The members so, interrogated. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to see if I'm following you because I had a note also uh -huh. around the singular goal here with right. emissions reduction. Yeah. Are you saying to add a goal of increased resiliency? Yes. Okay. So where I would take us on this. But, you know, trying to keep this at a higher level is mm -hmm. at the top of page 10. Um, one of the charges for the council is to identify means to accurately measure, and one of um, yeah. uh, you know, one of those things that we have talked about earlier this week is how do you measure resiliency? I actually have that too. Um, Yeah. It's section four. Three A three. Four, three. Um, so you need to get a copy of the bill as reduced. Just so yeah. Yeah. Okay. If we're just inventorying now, I think we skip ahead we of did. the whole the whole section. About the creation of the, of the council and the makeup and, but, yeah. and all of that. So why don't we just inventory this as uh, a question on um, defining resilience and measuring? And, and I'll think more over the weekend about how I see it fitting in. Well, yeah, I think. Uh, 
Are we done with section three? Uh, I don't think that's in section yeah. three. Which were the requirements and the requirements. Okay, so section four is the Climate Council and Climate Action Plan. And this goes on for a while, but. First question, what would be the other alternative, Bazaar? Yeah, so I, I, I think other ideas that have come up would be, you know, is there a new uh, position in government created um, that, you know, specifically has uh, authority over climate initiatives? That's something that's come up. I think another idea that has come up is uh, that ANR is not the right chair of this council, that it should be agency of administration. You know, Sue Mentor this morning talking about, you know, they're first among equals. Um, and uh, we've also heard testimony about ANR is the um, agency that has the technical expertise and also experience working with a number of these agencies on those issues. So I think that is definitely something we're going to have to wrestle with. Too. And we also had some, some suggestions about uh, different uh, representation on the on the uh, yep. on the council itself. So yep. it should just flag it. <coughs> yep. And uh, yes. I mean, what about the ranking member of each uh, of the legislative committees? Yeah. That's a poison pill for me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, I would say this is another broad area as to where the um, kind of leadership of the council resides here and, um, you know, whether or not there's a, a new position created. Uh, let's see. Does Massachusetts have a council or is theirs through the EPA? Yeah, so um, Massachusetts has a different regulatory structure than Vermont does in that they have an agency that incorporates uh, utility regulation, conservation, um, transportation, and um, that's a conservation and environmental protection, and there might be others, but that is transportation. is not included in that. Oh, I thought it was. Agriculture is. Okay, thank you. So there's a lot in that. Their version of ANR, very specifically utility. We got that. I guess the other question I have about that too is I know that they also have a committee on global warming and climate change. Mm -hmm. It's an actual oh. committee, just like yeah, this, like this. separate within uh, the executive branch. No, the no, legislative, no. legislative branch. Okay. I don't, and so I just I don't know what their actual mission Charges. is other than. We're doing, but I <laughs> just just something to yep. ponder as far as what what, their, what that looks like. I guess okay. from a serious perspective, would it make sense to just have somebody from each of the agencies in the executive branch, like an assigned person from that agency, so it's um, inclusive, representative of the, uh, all the aspects of state government, um, and more close knowledge of the inner workings of each of the agencies. I think that's something we should discuss. I mean, I, yeah, so I mean, we're flagging this as an area yeah, of the composition. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to solve this today. No, but. we're not. No. I don't think so. But I mean, wouldn't that be kind of the position if there was a czar that they're going to call in each expert in whatever agency to lay out, I mean, that's, that's different than having the same broad council with all these people on it. Yep. Right? I mean, right. <clears throat> One agency is not represented in this list. Well, so just as an aside, and, and I'm, I'm not suggesting this, but I've heard this from other people, and we've had some of this discussion today, that, um, you know, is there a place in the room for the state treasurer here who has, yeah. you know, planted, a, a, I think, played a, a key role in moving the clean water um, discussion along, you know, does she belong, or do they belong on the council? Um, yeah. That was another thing that I had flagged. 
and that I've heard um, as, as a suggestion. So. Also, the emergency management. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they are. <coughs> yeah. Right now, it's, it's public uh, safety. It's public safety. Yeah. yeah. That was meant. That was what it was meant to get at. So, but yes. Similar to um, human services, was really kind of meant as a euphemism for Department of Health. But. Okay. So clearly, kind of council leadership and construct. Regional planning commissions were brought up. Yep. National Guard. Mm -hmm. National Guard. Yeah, and the concept was also brought up that this shouldn't be 21, it should be 12. <laughs> so, who do you want to come? National Guard. <laughs> <laughs> Very helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. Um, Fellow Scotsman. So, I, I, I'm, I'm going to keep moving here yeah. through um, what, what the council is charged with in terms of um, responsibilities. Uh, something that I heard uh, in our discussion earlier today was, uh, and actually earlier this week, understanding, actually this would potentially fall outside the council, but understanding what programs state government currently has. Um, how much we spend on them, and what the efficacy <coughs> of those programs is. Um, that was brought up earlier in the week. Is that something that the council should take a look at? That was also brought up earlier today. That's yeah. information that the council should have on day one, uh, and that we should look outside the council to, to provide that information. I don't think that's a, I, I agree. I don't think it's the council's job to do that work. It's the council's job to have that information. Hope is strategy. Hope is not a strategy. Okay. Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Just not very effective. <laughs> so then we're really looking at. Uh, no. This, it would be outside yep. of this section of the bill, yep. but I'm just yep. flagging yep. kind of the inventory, you know, question, which I think is a good one. Okay. Um, I have. I'm not sure. Public infrastructure on page nine, line twelve. I'm not sure why. I have it there. I don't know if anybody else has a note there around public infrastructure. No, they're not. Oh, okay. I mean, I've added them myself. Yeah, I think you and I have talked about this. Okay. This, that, 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 what, that, what this. Um, Kind of section says, uh, you know, again, it's a charge for the council is uh, identifying, analyzing, and evaluating financing strategies to support this transition. That, financing that, that um, you know, what does that what does that relate to? Um, and one of the questions was financing public infrastructure, which could be everything from, you know, more hardened um, transportation infrastructure to uh, publicly owned charging stations, or financing strategies for the private sector to uh, accelerate the transition. You know, and I'm just making this up, but you know, the VITA funding to support, um, I don't know, there's a variety of different financing strategies. So, as you yes. and I talked about that, I don't know if we want to. Or school and municipal buildings. <coughs> school and municipal instance. buildings was, was one that we yeah. thought about as well. So where are you not by page number? Because we have different page editions here. Um, we're in the council yeah. section. The council shall is B, and then keep moving down under that, there's A, B, and C, or C. Got it. Thank you. This is line 12. Yep. Oh. Can you get it? It's working the same. Okay. Yeah, financing strategies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, so. yeah. Okay. Um, if I can go up to section B, line 8. 
I've circled analyzing each source or category of sources, and I have a note that says be specific, but I don't remember the details. Jenny Rushlow had said that uh, each source or category of sources invites speculation or something like that. And so she was suggesting marking out each source just saying, and just saying analyzing category. category categories or whatever categories of sources. Uh, and what I had written in, in parenthetically was industrial transportation buildings, etc. I don't know whether I, I think she said she suggested not uh, listing them, but mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure about that part. Remember that? No. There are clearly defined categories as part of the inventory that might be helpful as a template for this. You think? Right. That says. Here are the sectors that we look at for sources of emissions. There's no reason why that shouldn't change as part of the evaluation of the council. So should we just list, list sectors of sources, right? Just presenting that as an option for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. sure. So then I'm looking here about prioritizing, um, I have prioritized equity, but I think it means prioritizing areas where, uh, I'm not sure whether it goes in this section, but areas where the one we, we want to identify as meaning the most resources. Where are you, Mike? Um, it's just a note I have written down here. I don't know if it goes in this section or not. Maybe it goes on the A. Um, with regard to the subcommittees, um, there was a suggestion of um, evaluating and analyzing technical feasibility and cost effectiveness of existing strategies and programs. suggestion um, related to um, uh, economic challenges that I, I think this is kind of related to the Just Transition subcommittee, um, but having a specific subcommittee charge that relates to, um, I don't have the exact words here, but kind of economic challenges or economic harm that might result. Um, the second subcommittee. Okay, it just transitions in. Yeah, but it, it does talk about it. Maybe this needs to be more fleshed out. Um, uh, not unfairly burdening a group or community that also may include an economic sector. Anyway, I've just. I'm flipping through the, the next place that I get to is the, um, the Climate Action Plan, which is uh, sub, uh, 592, so on page 13 for me. But I don't want to cut off any other thoughts that people have in there. Uh, just seeing back in subcommittees, Yep. Um, I know we received suggestions that, or questions on whether there needed to be clarification on size and functioning, but I don't think so. I like it and being open. Yeah, so um, actually, thank you for bringing that up because I got a related point. Um, what I understand, and I, I'm looking to uh, Ledge Council, and Luke, you might not be the person, um, but with what things we need to include in here when you're creating a council. For example, I think we need term limits, and there's a question about staggering those term limits. Um, and you know, to your point, Robin, you know, what kind of power can we give? Here we've given the, the, uh, the council the ability to create 
subcommittees and, and there's some flexibility there. Mm -hmm. I'm presuming that's, we don't have to get granular in terms of, of uh, five members. Right, prohibiting, yeah, in, in, into that depth. But my understanding is what we do have to do is um, establish term limits yeah. um, or terms and that they should be staggered and that there should be an odd number of people uh, on the council as a whole. Okay. Those were parameters that I understand, but I, I, I don't. You're saying these are ideas you might want to pursue or something? No, these aren't ideas. Had to do these. No, these, yeah, this yeah. is what I understand that we, when you create a council, you. you told them you have to do it. What's that? Who told you you had to do it? Um, my friends on the Government Operations Committee. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I, again, I, I, there might I be somebody in your office that has expertise on this. Um, I don't know if. Uh, I don't know who the, who the lawyer is that deals with. Yeah, I think you sort of, well, that might be if, you like the, if you also like those ideas, we can certainly do it. Yeah. I don't know if you have to. Okay. Okay. Our number of people make sense if you're doing both, because that's where that comes from. Yeah. But you don't have to do yeah. it. But term limits, I mean, you know, you could have people that are put on here and they're on here for 20 years. When you term limits, like you can't have consecutive terms or you're there for five years. Remember, a lot of these folks are executive branch, so they might be there for 12 months, they might be there for four years. It's how long they have that position. Yeah. But some are not. True. But were you thinking of length of term or term limits? So I was thinking of both. Both. Okay. Um, and again, I don't want to solve this problem yeah. today. I want to flag it. I can check that. But, sure. You know, the question was um, terms, term limits, um, odd number of mm -hmm. people on the council, and. Uh, the question that I have is to how prescriptive we need to be as to the governance of the council. And um, my understanding is that you do not have to be prescriptive on mm -hmm. the governance of the council, that they can create those um, you know, rules of the road themselves. Mm -hmm. But that, that's a question I have. You are correct. Yeah. Okay. Oh, <coughs> just. Thought. I mean, I do, I do think there should be an odd number, but with a group this large, inevitably, at probably 50% of the meetings, someone's not going to be there at any <coughs> number of people anyway. But uh, so you could still have a tie vote on something. Um, getting back to the, uh, the the subcommittees, I just found my notes about what Sue Minter suggested this morning uh, around potentially another subcommittee, and, and what I wrote down was identif a, 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 a subcommittee to identify areas of vulnerability and, uh, uh, ri and risk and assess strategies to reduce risk, something like that. Yep. So that was the, and I may, maybe that's some just transitions or maybe it's something else. So again, I would put a charge to members of this committee as <laughs> to um, uh, Representative Spilia, uh had worked a lot on the thoughts behind um, one of these subcommittees and what it should cover. Um, two of the other subcommittees were left, frankly, <coughs> fairly general. Um, to the extent we want to flesh out more information there and be more prescriptive, um, if to the extent we want to jettison one or add one, that's up to this committee. And so uh, if that's something you're interested in, then, then we should go there. But I'll, I'll, again, I'll leave it to the committee, but I want to flag that yeah. as something that, because yeah. um, I agree, I heard that from Sumenter, I heard that from uh, Mr. Driscoll, who's here, um, with regard to you know specific economic harms that might result, and that should be captured here. So I'll, I'll leave it open as to the extent we want to be more prescriptive there. Okay, Climate Action Plan, Section 592. And I'll also say, <laughs> to be clear, we're not closing any doors on doing this stuff today, but I do want to capture things that are on people's minds. So, um, if, you know, if we don't have anything written down, then we don't need to stare at the page. But I, I do want to just collect things that people do have that are front line. Uh, Tim, I'm sorry. I just stepped out on one of our testifiers for next week. Yep. Who's calling. Okay. Um, on the rural resiliency. Yep. I'm sorry. I know the the subcommittee? Yeah. Um, there was one 
Well, this is probably too granular, but there was um, talking about uh, adaptation, the pressure that climate change, but climate change, and also climate change adaptation. Adaptation. Yeah. That was it. So both. Sorry. Under the Rural Resiliency Task Force. Right, but, we're, but it's already got adaptation in it, right? Nope, definitely. Well, the title of the committee is oh, Rural Resiliency and Adaptation Subcommittee. So Actually, Sue has suggested adding risk reduction to that as well. So in other words, wind is going wind and rain are gonna put pressure on rural areas. All of the economic changes that are happening in the world to deal with climate change, adaptation, will also put pressure. So and, mm -hmm. and this is in B. in with the earlier when I was citing the resiliency. Um, so we mention it in the action plan on uh, page 13, line 18, um, which I think, so there, the, the plan is to reduce emissions and build, build resiliency. And I think that highlights the need to kind of define it more uh, have it be a goal earlier for requiring that the plan address it, and it should be in goals uh, before. Okay. Well, let's think how to do that because yeah. the, the only reason I say let's think how to do that is because the what is now the requirements section um, is existing statute that yep. specifically is about um, greenhouse gas emissions. Right. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't yeah. do that. I'm just saying let's think about where. It, Belongs and I don't want it to focus. And yes, we're yeah. bringing it up here as to be included in the plan. So it seems like we should talk about it right. ahead of that. Yeah. Yes. So maybe my question is on this section as well. So when it talks about, um, so I'm in little B. Yep. Um, uh, Are you in the plan section? Yep. Yeah. Um, talking about including regulatory and legislative changes. Um, that's where my concern lied with, this is what they have to uh, put forth specific initiative programs and strategies including that. But above and beyond that, like I say, if the legislature on their own um, jumped in with passing some legislation that would affect their plan and strategies, how, how does that fit into it? Um, because they only they only go back every four years, right? Right. So let me just be clear on the question. Um, I think I heard this come up a couple times. Does uh, um, this doesn't preclude legislation? Legislature can legislate any time outside of this. And I may have heard you ask this question. If we do things as a legislature that are outside of this plan that accomplish greenhouse gas emission reduction, um, would it count towards accomplishing uh, the requirements? Right, how do they include it? What's the process for them to include that in their strategies and, you know, initiatives, specific initiatives, because that, that would, is what it would be. It would be a specific initiative that the legislature passed. That's well, outside of this. It's outside of that. If the, so if the objective is to reduce greenhouse gas, gases and it's accomplish it, we do something that, that helps to accomplish that, then why wouldn't it count? Well, well it's a question the, of, how you, of how you count it. Right. Check, I, check, right? Yep, I understand that it would count, but I'm just saying how would it 
how would it fit into the plan? Would they then, if it, if it was so something it huge, the plan could they, or could could they back it. off on another proposal enough to still meet uh, the goal? Uh, so, so again, I just want to make sure I'm clear because, you know, with, with the pathway to address the question you have, can the legislature step in and alter the plan? Is that the question you have? Well, no, again, you know, the, the, the council, how, how are they going to consider, uh, you know, we meet every year, so yep. we could conceivably every year put in a new proposal to limit carbon emissions, okay. right? So they've already got a plan. They've already established a plan. They're going down the road. Yep. And all of a sudden, we've thrown in these other things. Are you saying just let that go as well, but not be included in any reductions that they have uh, plans for, that they've already considered in their, their ultimate, ultimate plan? I, I just don't. I think somehow it's, it's got to be um, interconnected. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know how, but I, I think it should be considered somehow. Yep. But I, I don't know. I, I think, I, if I may, I, I think what you're saying is that when you uh, lay out a, a program or a plan to re reduce emissions somehow, um, part of that plan is developing metrics for determining that you reduced emissions. So if there, if the, if the legislature comes up with a, with a, di a plan that isn't included in this, in, in, in the council's plan, um, that is somehow overlooked or something, or is it different anyway? There would, might be another account accounting of greenhouse gas reductions that then isn't captured in, in, in this plan. Is that, right. is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Does so, that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Doesn't make sense to me because well, I mean, it, the sources of greenhouse gas. Yes, well, because the measurements are not going to change, so no, no, but the, the measurements. <laughs> I, I want to be careful that we don't debate yeah. here. Yeah. I just yeah. want to yeah. Yeah. Um, flag, yeah. and I think it's a really important question, actually, um, right. as to how we deal with that issue. Yeah. Um, you know, the goal here, the, the, the ultimate goal we're trying to get to is reduction in emissions, and um, I don't. Who gets credit for that? I'm, and I know that's not your question, but... Well, yeah. let, let me put it a different way then. Okay, let's say the agency of natural resources through rules throws out a particular proposal, but we as legislators almost at the same time put out a bill that's in conflict with what the agency's already done, mm -hmm. and they're basically saying, well, wait a minute, you know, we've already, we've already proposed, it's already been proposed by the council in this way, we're going down the road to rules, you just passed a law that really is a little bit different, tweaks Fix it in a different way. Where do we stand? I might be able to answer some of those questions if you want, or we can yeah. do it another time. So if emissions go down, the way I visualize it, emissions go down. So whatever the reason you went down, the recession, the depression, who knows? You're meeting your targets. That's what matters. Um, if there's a plan and the legislature passes a law that's outside that plan, something different. You would hope that each entity in the legislature would be aware of what the council is doing, the council would look at what the legislature is doing, and maybe modify their plan accordingly. I don't know how you legislate that they do that, but you'd hope to be aware of what's going on in the state and modify the plan accordingly. As your last question, law trumps rules. So they got a great idea of all the rules that ANR should do, and the legislature steps in and passes a law that's different, law governs. But usually laws are general, rules are specific, so you know it's usually not either or, but yes, laws trump rules. So legislature goes ahead and does something by law that would trump any rules that are being developed if they're in conflict. Okay. Was that the rules section?
Something that I flagged in the rules section uh, was in um, A2, uh, I had um, bracketed the term reasonable basis and uh, wrote a question in the margin, would it help the agency to lay out what constitutes a reasonable basis? And um, that was actually a question that was flagged a couple times. Uh, I had after today with Jen's testimony and Jen Duggan's testimony and Kay uh, perhaps there's a need to be even more explicit there which is the bottom of page 19 yeah about uh, no uh, agency or departments <coughs> Rulemaking authority is needed. So, what did you say again, Laura? Uh, it's K. Yeah, got it. Um, uh, Jen it. Duggan had yes. uh, indicated that there is perhaps a, a need to be, um, here. be more explicit. Over, yeah, be more explicit. Yeah. That no one's rulemaking is. I don't know. That's pretty explicit. That's pretty explicit. Uh, I have a note on the very beginning of rules, uh, page 16, uh, lines 15 and 16. Um, and I think this is 593. Yeah. Five nine three. Yeah. A. Yeah. Um, and I believe that it relates to where it says consistent with the Vermont Action Plan. Oh, yes. Okay. And it was, my notes is adhere to. Yes, this was a Jenny Rushlight comment also about something. So I, my scribble was shall adopt regulations as prescribed by the plan as opposed to consistent. The word consistent. Yeah. And what I had mentioned uh, when Professor Rushlaw was testifying was uh, some struggling with this um, in that being cautious about uh, directing the regulatory body to do, you know, with precision what the plan says as opposed to staying within the bounds of the plan. Um, and Again, we can pick away at what that word is. Um, the intention was to give uh, some flexibility to operate within bounds. And that, that was essentially that, why that word was chosen. Another phrase that I wrote down was necessary to carry out. Yeah, necessary think, to accomplish. I think we're, what we're trying to find a balance between yeah. Jen and Rushlaw, trying, trying to give legal precision and cover and maybe Mary Powell's just get a plan, plan. still do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, let's flag that. I've forgotten that. things I'll flag in the cause of action section are in both A3 and in B3, and it's, a, it's the same change in each, that, um, that when a court uh, reaches for the remedy of, of uh, requiring the secretary to, um, uh, to take prompt action or adopt or update rules that they be in accordance with the plan or in accordance with this right. uh, this law. Actually, I can't remember which it was, but being clear that the court can't um, <coughs> prescribe action that is outside of, of uh, 
what this, you know, what the plan or what the law calls for. And what's that based on? What is that supposed to address? So, for example, in um, on page 21, line 16, uh, what this section would then say is the court shall enter an order directing the secretary to adopt or update rules in accordance with this act um, so that the uh, court couldn't uh, take, couldn't require action that might be outside of what we're calling for here, that they are confined to um, things that are allowed under this. That the, that the court is not making policy. Right? Yeah. So is that the concern that the judge's order is too specific and legislated from the bench, or did they go off the, you know, yeah. go far afield and come up with something just Yeah, I think the concern, contrary. so this was actually raised by Representative Sherman, but okay. um, that, the, uh, that the court may um, ask for rulemaking that um, would in fact result in greenhouse gas emission reduction, but is inconsistent with um, where we are in the, and I think what I'm struggling with is whether it's where we are within the confines of this statute, or whether uh, it's someplace outside of the, um, the plan. I don't know which it would be. But it's basically the court exceeding authority Either being too specific or too going too far afield. Yeah, but just I'm asking, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. Uh, I'm going to let you struggle with that. <laughs> is that, <laughs> the, is that yeah. the evil you're trying to prevent? Yes. 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 Judge legislating from the bench, either being too specific or going too far afield. My interpretation, of what, or my understanding of Heidi's concern, was the too specific. We don't want a judge saying, you must adopt rules that say this, as opposed right. to achieve this goal. Well, again, I'm trying to stay within the confines of what we're doing here. Uh, you know, but there's a lot of um, guidelines, I think, that we're giving here for rulemaking um, and for the writing of this plan. And the concern here is that a judge would go outside of that. Right. There's a scenario where the plan's not leading to the results you wish, according to our hasn't done it. Well, in this section is that they haven't done enough. Uh, they've actually <coughs> they've adopted rules, they've done yeah. it in a timely fashion, okay. and now we're in, um, we're in part B of this section where what has been done has been insufficient mm -hmm. and more needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the judge may prescribe is not only more, but more that's outside of the bounds of, of and here's where I'm struggling, outside the bounds of the plan, gotcha. or is it outside the bounds of the statute? I don't know which it would be. Okay. Can I flag a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Right. I, I have a question around whether, so just thought of hypothetical. The plan lays out a strategy that is insufficient. Yep. And A&R conduct rules that were prescribed to it by said plan. Yep. But were held to account for not meeting the goals. Yep. But what happens? Yeah. So. I'm going to draw my deep well of legal knowledge here that what this section says is that the court finds that the rules adopted by the secretary are the substantial cause of failure. So would that be something that would not allow the judge to hold the council, council? not the council, the secretary? Um, uh, well, if our if, if the plan occurs and our rulemaking authority follows from that plan, yeah, then I don't see how we would be a substantial cause of that failure if we were following the authority given to us. That's my point. So I don't see how the judge can find in favor of the plaintiff there. But your authority is also to achieve the reductions. It's plan and achieve reductions. And if the plan isn't good enough, you're supposed to achieve those reductions. I thought the plan, it just said that if the, if the plan doesn't happen, then we're supposed to do it. Oh, so you're, 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 you're talking about where a plan is not adopted. We're talking about the way the plan is insufficient. The plan is not adopted is another ball of wax, but... Yeah. The plan is not sufficient. sufficient. Right, what happens? And 
So, so yes. if, if, a, if a plan is made and the agency uh, creates rules in accordance with what the plan is, right. and then the reductions don't get done, then it's um, not the fault of the agency. It would be that's, that's not how go, the back, to go back and revise the plan. Right. I mean, that might be a defense. Like we're trying really, yeah. really hard. Yeah. Uh, but they still got to achieve the reductions. Right. So even if they, they're following the plan and the plan is insufficient for some reason, exponential economic growth, more cars on the road, wasn't foreseen. So if the plan didn't foresee it, they didn't foresee it. You're still not meeting those reduction targets. Mm -hmm. They still, uh, there's still going to be a cause of action against it yeah. failing to achieve those reductions. Well, so I, I think this goes back to um, how you presented uh, how you took us through the bill, Luke, in terms of kind of the steps yeah. at each, which I think is important to keep in mind, yeah. which, which is what's required at each step. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for example, at the, at the rulemaking step, um, there's requirements that, you know, kind of show your work, um, that there's a demonstration that there's sufficiency in what's being done. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's naive to think then that when you get you know, if this devolved to a point where we're in a cause of action and we have not met the targets, um, there is still a record that shows that the agency has done work, mm -hmm. they've shown their work, and, you know, if it, if it doesn't accomplish it, I think where you get to then is, is the judge saying, the work you've done is insufficient. It was a substantial cause of failure, and you've got to go back and do more. It, it's possible, and that's really it's hard to predict because that's really the role of the judge to make that decision. So, but I think that's possible. Okay. So, I'm, I'm looking at what's it, 592? The, the, the last paragraph before 593, except for 593. Huh? Sub, sub paragraph e. it's, uh, 16, page 16. Do we give up the I'm on, I'm on this one. I'm on the, for me, it's page 16, line 9. If the, if the council fails to adopt the, the plan or update the plan yeah. as required by the charter, then the secretary yeah. is on the hook, right? Yeah. So the, the ANR still has, 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 to, has to make rules to meet the greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, yeah. regardless of the plan. And this is kind of, I, I, I would characterize this as um, kind of <coughs> the, 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 the in emergency break glass um, yeah. s statute here, which, or uh, part of the statute, which essentially says the council has an obligation, but what if for whatever reason they can't come to an agreement, right. um, you know, they fail to get right. there. Um, my presumption is that the council does not want that to happen. The council has the power and ability to move forward here. If they fail to do that, then it's on ANR. Right. right. Then it's on ANR. Right. So that's when it comes back to Peter's comment about the substantial cause business. And I noticed when, when you when you used the phrase, you said the substantial cause, not a substantial cause. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering about whether the versus a mm -hmm. is important. We're getting the course of thing there. Yeah. Okay. Any other things to flag in the cause of action section? Section six is where the um, you know, some of the highlights of, of terms and oh. term limits or whatever. Yeah. The styling of terms. Yeah. 
um, in section seven uh, to, we took testimony this morning as to whether or not uh, in the state energy policy uh, there should be a provision here that uh, draws the state energy policy kind of in compliance to what we're trying to do here. That was on line 18. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think this also begs the question of whether resiliency should be added here. As part of the energy policy? Yes. Those are things that I had, um, and I also, you know, we have a bunch of testimony, um, particularly in the last couple of days, where folks have provided very specific suggestions, um, some of which are captured in this discussion, some of which weren't. But I, I want to go through as well. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Thank, that was actually helpful for me just to go through, so I really appreciate people taking an extra hour today. Thank you, Luke. What are your thoughts for next week and this inventory? Yeah. Or um, the schedule in general? Yeah.